We'll get started in about two or three minutes, so if you want to settle and, and come to your desks, that'd be great. So we'll get started. I'm looking at you, Ian. <laughs> things I do as the as the designated official is I start us and end us it's a legal requirement that I do that so I call the meeting to order I even have a gavel though I don't know that I'm going to use that have to hit it. Have to hit it. 
There. The inaugural meeting of the Commerce Data Advisory Council is called to order. Um, we have some uh, general housekeeping to do for this first hour. Uh, and, and we're basically going to talk a little bit about the, the, fe the Federal Advisory Committee Act that we function under. This is a very public process, it's a very open and transparent process, and there are important reasons for that. I'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, but as members of the committee, you also have ethical considerations that you have to keep in mind. Eric Osterman from the uh, General Counsel's Office of the Department is here, and in a moment he'll get us started. First, I just wanted to, to welcome all of you and thought maybe we should do a quick introduction. We're going to introduce ourselves twice today because when the secretary comes, we're going to ask you to introduce yourself to the secretary. But maybe for our own benefit, we should just run around the room real quickly and say who we are. Like I said, I'm Burton Rice. You know me because I've been inundating you with emails. Um, so welcome. And the other thing is when you talk, you have to press the button and you're not, you're not being picked up. That's critical for the live stream. So whenever you, whenever you talk, whenever you're called on a talk or you participate in a discussion, make sure you press the button. So why don't we go to the left? Testing. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Chris DeBona uh, with, with uh, I work for Google and I've been involved in open source software and open data since 1994. So. Uh, my name is Dana Boyd. I'm a principal researcher at Microsoft Research and the founder of Data and Society, which is a research institute looking at social, cultural, and ethical issues that emerge because of data. Hi, I'm Daniel Castro. I'm a director of the Center for Data Innovation as also vice president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, which is a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> and I, we've been working on, we're a nonprofit think tanks working on uh, issues related to data analytics, internet things, and open data. I'm Karen Remington, I'm Chief uh, Science Officer for Arjuna Solutions, which is a, a business analytics company. My, my, um, my recent history, though, also includes um, doing genomic sciences with uh, the NIH and with the Craig Venter Institute. Oh, thanks. I'm Steve Adler. I work for IBM. I'm uh, Alan Blue, and I'm co-founder and vice president of product management at LinkedIn. I'm Kim Stevenson. I'm the CIO at Intel, and I'm on the board of directors of Cloudera. Hi, I'm Kevin Merritt. I'm the founder and CEO of Socrata. Hello, I'm CJ Moses. I'm a general manager at Amazon Web Services. Hi, good morning. I'm Colin Paris. I'm the vice president of software and analytics research at GE. Hi, I'm Stan Humphreys. I'm chief economist at Zillow. Good morning. I'm Vadim Kutze. I'm head uh, of data strategy and stewardship at PayPal and very recently head of the eBay Inc. Data Labs. Hello, I'm Heather Joseph. I'm the executive director of Spark, which is an advocacy organization that works on opening up access to scientific, educational, and research data and all kinds of other resources. Hi, I'm Brian Schimpf. I'm director of engineering at Palantir Technologies. I'm Jack Dangerman. I'm with an organization called Estri. Kati Bonner, Indiana University. We take large scale scholarly technology data sets and render them into maps of science. We also build the macroscopes that actually convert this data into insights. Hi, I'm Bill Gale. I'm co-founder of Global Weather Corporation and also past president of the American Meteorological Society. Hello, I'm Joy Bonagaro, uh, Chief Data Officer for City and County of San Francisco and perhaps the sole government external representative here. Hi, everyone. As Burton said, I'm Eric Osterman from the Department of Commerce's Office of General Counsel. Um, I'll be doing your ethics briefing in a, in a few moments. And hello. My name is Ian Kalin. I'm the Chief Data Officer for the Department of Commerce. And uh, apparently, I'm the official chair of this event uh, and this council. But uh, we'll see if we can do some things to change that in a little bit. Uh, I will just briefly say I am overwhelmed and inspired and honored that all of you are here today. Uh, you'll be hearing from a number of my bosses uh, throughout the course of today, but uh, I want to echo their words up front and say thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. We are extraordinarily grateful for the opportunity to, to learn from you and to receive your guidance and insight as to how we should be more responsible data stewards, um, not just the Department of Commerce, but really the entire federal government and what we can do to better support uh, the American people, of course, with the 
uh, objectives and goals of the Department of Commerce that also includes improving the competitiveness of American businesses. Uh, the Secretary uh, believes that she is the voice of American businesses. Uh, the Department of Commerce uh, has some uh, ambition and some pride behind saying very publicly that we are America's data agency, largely because we are trying really hard to make all of your organizations as uh, successful as possible. Uh, but we need a lot of help. And I think you all know it. And so uh, throughout the, the course of these next two days, all, uh, I'll ask up front is uh, please challenge us, uh, be honest. Uh, of course, everything we're saying right now is rather public and uh, rather well recorded. Uh, but I, I would ask for your ambition to go beyond the formality and understand that we're really trying to get to work here. We're really trying to do great things. But we also recognize that we cannot do it ourselves. And so uh, with that, uh, well, I'm very excited for a busy couple of days. Uh, we have a lot of stuff that we try to cram in here, but it's only because, again, we want to provide the right format to listen to you and uh, to engage your expertise as to what we should be doing in the future. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to the, to the DFO. How many acronyms are we going to have this weekend? Quite a few. Okay. DFO takes over. DFO for CDAC, Burton Wright. Ah. So, um, just uh, the two other points. The restrooms are out the door to the left. Uh, there are emergency exits if we were to have to vacate the building. They're well signed on either, in either direction. So I'm going to turn it over to Eric now for our ethics briefing. Hi. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, just to begin with, I'm going to pass around a sign-in sheet. Uh, if you could all write your name legibly so we can uh, give you all credit for being here and having satisfied your mandatory ethics briefing. Um, so we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, um, so I'm here from the, like I said, the Ethics Division in the Office of General Counsel. I'm going to talk to you about the rules that apply uh, to all of you serving on this advisory committee. Um, you've all been appointed as special government employees, um, which means that uh, basically you've been appointed as independent experts on this subject of data. Um, the department wants your opinion, your personal expert opinion on the, on the, inform on the uh, topics we'll be covering. Um, so you're not here on behalf of your companies uh, or any other organizations. You're here on your, your own behalf as independent experts. Um, and as special government employees, uh, many of the ethics rules do apply to you, although in a somewhat different way than they may apply to, to regular employees. Um, the, uh, the first area, and I should say before I start, you know, if you have any questions as we go, um, feel free to ask. And then when I finish again, um, you know, any questions, feel free to, to raise them. Um, so uh, to begin with, I'll talk about conflict of interest rules. Uh, basically, under, the, uh, under federal law, um, as a special government employee, just as, as a regular employee, um, you cannot participate in a matter, you cannot work on a matter uh, that will have a direct and predictable effect on your financial interest. Now, your financial interest includes the interest of your spouse, your minor child, uh, prospective employer if you are applying for employment, and also an organization where you serve as an officer or director. And there are some exemptions for holdings in stocks. Uh, holdings in a diversified mutual fund will never create a conflict of interest. Uh, holdings in a sector fund that concentrates in a particular industry. In that case, there's no conflict of interest as long as you hold no more than $50,000 in that fund. Um, also, uh, this committee, like most advisory committees, I imagine, um, will be working on policy issues, not matters involving specific identified companies, but you know, helping to set data policy for commerce um, and uh, hopefully to improve the government as a whole in the way it handles data. Um, and so because of that, um, there are some additional exemptions. Um, you can work on a matter, on a policy matter, um, that will affect the company that you own as long as you have no more than $25,000 invested in that company. Um, or you have no more than $50,000 total invested in the particular industry sector that will be affected by the matter you are working on. Um, there's also an exemption that allows you to work on a policy matter that will affect your, your employer uh, as part of a group or, or industry. Now, having said, uh, having said so much about all the rules, um, we've reviewed the charter for this committee, and we don't believe that the uh, work of the committee will have a direct and predictable effect on any particular company or group of companies. This is really broad policy issues we'll be working on, broad data issues um, that should really not implicate or be a problem under the uh, conflict of interest rule I've just gone over. Um, 
But that being said, you know, if any questions come up uh, while you're serving on the committee, any questions about whether um, something you're working on could pose a conflict, uh, you can certainly get in touch with my office through, through Burton uh, and we can look at the issue and whether that might be a problem. But as I said, we really, these are broad policy issues, um, so we don't expect to see any, any conflicts arising. Um, another conflict of interest rule is based on an ethics regulation and it actually deals with um, the last issue I talked about, the last rule dealt with uh, policy matters as well as matters like contracts and grants, more matters that involve specific parties. This second rule now only applies to matters involving specific parties, matters like contracts or grants. Um, and what the rule says is that you can't work on a matter involving specific parties if someone with whom you have a close personal or business relationship uh, is a party or represents a party in that matter. Now, uh, given the work of advisory committees generally in this committee, I highly doubt that this rule have you know, any application to you um, because as I said, it only applies to matters involving specific identified parties. Um, you're not gonna be reviewing any contracts or grants um, or agreements while you're, while you're serving. So. I'll put that out there, but we really, that typically doesn't come up for special government employees on these committees. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Um, the next area is gifts. And this gets into bribes and things like that where people you know, would often look at uh, sort of the issue of corruption and all that we want to avoid. Um, so it's what a lot of people think of when they think about ethics. And of course, uh, you know, as a special government employee, just as as an employee, you cannot accept a bribe. You can't accept you know, money or another item in return for taking action or not taking action as a government employee. Um, uh, what employees more commonly have issues with is, is gifts. And again, this shouldn't be a problem for all of you. But basically, you can't accept a gift that's offered to you because of your service as a special government employee. And you also can't accept a gift that's offered to you by a prohibited source. Now, a prohibited source is basically any organization or entity that has matters before the Department of Commerce um, or a majority of whose members has matters or interests or business before the Department of Commerce. So as you can see, given the breadth of the Department of Commerce's work, a prohibited source is gonna be pretty much anyone out there. Now, fortunately, before you all panic and leave the room, um, there are several exceptions here that make this palatable. Um, you can accept a gift that's given to you because of your outside business. Um, and for all of you, your outside business is your business. It's your main business, obviously. Um, and we're grateful that you're uh, you know, <laughs> putting that aside for a few moments to come here. We really appreciate that. Um, and so this exception exists that you can always accept the gift offered to you because of your outside job or outside employment or business activities. Um, and that should cover 90% of the gifts that are likely to be offered to people. Um, you can also accept any gifts offered to you uh, by a close personal friend or a family member. Um, so even if you don't have business with your mom, you can still accept your uh, birthday present from her um, when your birthday comes along again. We won't take that away from you. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, it doesn't typically come up with advisory committees like this, but if there were an invitation extended to um, you know, people serving on the committee to attend a, a local event you know, in the DC area, um, maybe a trade show or other event, um, there is an exception to, uh, to accept invitations like this. Basically, if the event is widely attended, there's a large number of people going, and there's a diversity of interest being represented, um, then you could go to that event. And that would be you know, if the invitation came to you as a result of your service on the committee. Um, and you know, we really haven't seen that before, but I'll just put it out there. Um, and if that did come up, you know, Burton would be the point of contact. He would know about that, and he and I would, would talk about it and make sure everything was, um, was handled. Okay, um, as far as other activities, the, the Hatch Act applies to um, special government employees as it applies to all employees, and the Hatch Act actually regulates our engagement in political activity. Um, now, fortunately for special government employees like all of you, it's a very limited application. Um, and so the application of the Hatch Act is you cannot engage in a partisan political activity during your government duty hours while you're on government premises um, or using any government resources. And a partisan political activity is any activity geared toward the success or failure of a partisan political campaign, candidate, or, or group. Um, 
So you just have to refrain from engaging in those activities while you are um, on duty or on government premises. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so there's also a restriction on uh, representing others before a federal agency because of your status as a special government employee. Basically, you cannot represent someone other than yourself before a federal agency or court in any matter involving identified parties if you participate in that matter as part of your duties as a special government employee. Um, now, the matter that comes up, it, this really isn't going to apply because it has to be a matter that you participate in as a special government employee that involved identified specific parties. And again, like I said earlier, that, that's just not going to happen with this group. You're going to be working on policy issues. Um, so while it's good to keep this in mind, um, I, I highly doubt that this restriction will have much impact on, on any of you. Um, moving on, uh, probably the most obvious area of the ethics rules um, is about misusing government resources. So in you know, all the resources that are allocated to this committee, this group, to, um, to help us and uh, you know, improve how we handle data at the department, um, all of those resources need to only be used, of course, for official government work, official committee work. Um, so any equipment, supplies, or personnel that are allocated to this committee, um, you know, that time and equipment can only be used for committee business. Um, a government title is actually considered uh, a government resource as well. So your title is a special government employee or a member of the CDAC. Um, uh, because it's official, should mainly only be used for your participation in committee work and official business. Uh, you would not be able to use that title, that affiliation, as part of a, of a personal outside activity that you're engaging in. Um, that's only for official work. <clears throat> um, although I will say there is there is an exception so that if you are engaging in a personal activity or if you're just writing up you know, a, a resume or biographical sketch about yourself, you could include your CDAC affiliation, your title, as part of that biography about yourself. You know, maybe it's a one-page paragraph like you'd see on the back of a book jacket, you know, just sort of a discussion about you, your interest, what you do, um, and you could also mention along with those other details that you serve on the CDAC. That would be fine. <clears throat> okay. Um, as part of the CDAC, um, it's possible that you will receive uh, non-public information or data uh, you know, as a special government employee. And of course, all that information needs to be kept secret and, and confidential. Um, any, any business contacts that you obtain as a result of uh, your work with the government, um, you know, if, that's, if that's federal information, if it's government information you're getting, then you should not be using that for personal uh, outside business. Um, <clears throat> I think that's about it for government resources. I think it's, like I said, fairly intuitive. Um, there are some rules. Once you, as a special government employee, once your service on the CDAC completes, um, I mean, you will not be able to represent other people before a federal agency or a federal court um, concerning a matter involving specific parties that you actually worked on while you served on the committee. And again, you're not going to work on specific party matters, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, and then once you leave, as I said before, uh, but even once you leave, um, any confidential or non-public information has to remain non-public. So what's, what's secret stays secret even after you leave the committee. Um, and uh, the last thing I'll say is you all filed those uh, OGE 450 forms. Um, and thank you for that. I know it, it takes a lot of time. Um, we do have to collect those annually from you. Um, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time to, to complete those. Um, any questions? I've reached the end of my summary. <laughs> no? Okay, great. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'm just going to add to Eric's, Eric's summary and talk a little bit about the legal framework that we function under, the Federal Advisory Committee Act. And I think it's important just to touch very briefly on the history of this. Um, advisory committees and councils have been around since the founding. But subsequent to World War II, they exploded. There were, there were many of them. And there was an increasing public concern about the somewhat clandestine nature or the lack of exposure, the lack of transparency around advisory councils. Some of them, were there were allegations of extravagance. There were allegations of collusion. And, and those concerns evolved through the late 60s and really culminated with the Federal Advisory Committee Act. And it coincided with the Freedom of Information Act which were both attempts or, or real pushes to make government 
uh, function in a more open and transparent way. Um, so out of the FACA, there are some regulations that we have to function under. One is that our meetings and deliberations have to be open and transparent, and we have to maintain a public record of them. Uh, we have to have a 15-day notice of any advisory committee meeting. And, and we have to take minutes of these meetings, and in fact, we're live streaming this meeting, and most advisory committees are, starting, are doing this now because it's a very easy way to maintain the public record. Um, unfortunately, the FACA was written in 1972 and reflects 1972 technology. So there really isn't a lot of accommodation or, or, or amendment to the FACA to, to recognize that we live in a digital world now. So any time that we were all to come together as a conference call, for example, we have to treat that as a meeting. Um, any time we email the entire committee, somebody emails the entire committee, we have to trans treat about the substantive, substance of the work of the committee, we have to treat that as a public record. Um, I promise we're not going to go too far with this, and we're not going to be hyper about it. But for example, the, the emails that you got from Ian about the scope of the work and what we're trying to accomplish, we captured those, and, and that, that'll become part of the public, public record. Um, Although I can briefly say on that, even the hackpad, so we're trying. We're trying to use even some basic, free, modern collaboration tools to do even the simplest things of sharing an agenda but as long as we're able to record it, right? So we're, we're right. Th there's the, from the, even literally from the first emails, the common sense digital question of, we have to do this, but what do people, what's actually gonna help? What's the right way to do this? So I got, sorry right. for interrupting. No, but, no, please. Uh, it's an, uh, a, a, something that we want to explain in terms of how eager we are to uh, basically catch up to the modern practices that you're all using today. Right. And it's actually, you know, this, this, this commitment to transparency is a good thing. Uh, I think that, that it is important in, in our democracy and it's an important, um, it's an important process that we can actually take advantage of, that you can actually take advantage of. Uh, we're all about making our data more useful and accessible and easily workable for the general public, and there are opportunities to engage the general public in a, in a variety of ways, and we'll be thinking about that and talking about that as we go forward. Um, there is a provision to close meetings, and Eric touched on this a little bit. Um, unlikely that we will actually rise to the threshold that qualifies for a closed meeting. It generally, a meeting is closed if, if classified or administratively restricted information was being addressed or proprietary information was being addressed. There would be reasons to, to close a meeting. But again, it's a, it's a high threshold. The general counsel's office would, would have to approve it, and it's unlikely we'll do that. However, there is an important um, caveat to all of this. And that is that, that we can establish working groups, we can establish sub-committees sub, uh, and explore particular issues or particular aspects, and we don't have to be as vigilant in recording that work. So if, if a group of you goes and, for instance, looks at privacy and questions around privacy, you have the freedom to do that. You have the freedom to interact with each other and explore what you need to explore. Uh, the only provision is that whatever the committee is going to address around your work is presented back to the committee in this public forum. So if six of you go off and do this work for a couple of months, you'll write a report and submit it. You might come up with recommendations and bring them back to the committee, but that'll be recorded and presented back in this public forum. Um, that, that subcommittee's working group process actually gives us some other opportunities. Um, we don't just have to keep that to the people around this table. You can include colleagues, you can include staff. We can find people, in experts in areas and commission them to, to do sub work, subcommittee work for us and come back to us. I know you're all incredibly busy people. We are so excited you're here and taking the time to be here. But if, if there are ways that we can, can leverage your experience and, and the work that you're associated with um, by, by working with colleagues or with staff members or with other people in the field that you're aware of, that's another opportunity for us where, to, do, to do powerful work. So that's something to kind of keep in the back of your mind for the next couple of days. We'll probably come back to this in future meetings and, and, and find ways to leverage this opportunity that we have. Um, and I think that's really all. I, th I, I guess the other thing I'd just say about my role is, as Eric touched on, um, I'm here to make sure you're able to do your work. And I want to facilitate that in every way I can. 
Uh, you've seen the name Tanja White. She's around here somewhere. Is is my right hand in this process. There are a number of other people, but but we're here to help you. We're here to answer questions. We're going to try to give you as much information that you need to make this process work. I am not formally a member of the committee. And when I went through training to be a DFL, they made that really clear. Um, you're the committee. Ian's the committee. Lynn's the committee. Um, and and that's, that's, I think, an important thing to remember. So I won't be weighing in on the substance of your work. I'll be trying to support the substance of your work. And anything I can do, I want to just put, put that out there. It's my job. Don't feel like you're hassling me. I need, I need to hear from you about what I can do to, to provide assistance, what we can do to provide assistance. And after the meeting, if there are things that would have been helpful to you prior to this meeting, let me know. Let us know, and we'll address that going forward. So unless there are questions, comments? Yeah, Ken. Uh, so we don't have dates for additional meetings. Right. How do we get to the additional dates? So we're going to, we wanted to wait and have this meeting. We're going to... Um, I think we're going to use Doodle, right, or oh, yeah, something sure. like yeah. that to, to try to find a sweet spot. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get that out early next week, and we'll actually plan the next three meetings. But we're looking at a meeting in July, a meeting around October, a meeting around next January. And we'll, we'll find the sweet spot. It's hard to get something that works for everybody. I think it's amazing. We got 18 out of 19 here today. Um, and, and I think that uh, we'll, 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 we'll gauge that as we as we go forward. The other thing is, is that, is that um, we're hopeful, I mentioned this in one of my emails, that um, we want a co-chair from the committee to work alongside Ian. And I'd like you all to think about that, about who would be good, whether you, any of you are interested in that. We were thinking about um, just like making a phone call and designating somebody, but we, the more we talked about it, the more we felt that this was, um, this could be an organic process. We sort of crowdsource it among the CDAC and that, that somebody will emerge. But we want somebody in that, in that role. It's not an onerous job, but it's somebody for Ian to sit down with as he thinks about future agendas and shapes the work of the committee going forward. Um, you know, a co-chair, I've, I've worked with other advisory councils or committees before, and, and it's, very, it's very powerful to have somebody from the committee alongside uh, somebody from the government working to figure out how the committee works forward. And, and it's, it's actually a way, way of somebody among you to gauge where you all are and feed that back to Ian as, as we go forward. So be thinking about that. Think about it. Talk to, amongst yourselves as you're in between breaks or meetings or tonight if you're at the reception. And, and we'll come back and revisit this late tomorrow morning and hopefully arrive at a co-chair. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Ian, who's going to walk us through the agenda. And then we have lunch around the corner and time to just um, get to know each other a little bit. And, and we'll head toward 1 o'clock when the true substance of the meeting begins. But he you know, walk through where we're headed from here. Uh, yeah. Since oh. this is live streaming, I yeah. there's no prohibition on social media. So we'll None. Presence of the, me of the meeting and high level comments. Be sure when you talk, you press. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. that, that, that I was, was asking about social media yeah. and prohibitions right. on that. Uh, no prohibitions. Twitter hashtag is on the screen. Um, you can imagine in good old government fashion the arguments about what is a good Twitter hashtag to prevent like the Commerce Data Advisory Council meeting. After some vetting, we found that this one is not being used by anybody else. Um, so uh, please uh, share this broadly. Sadly, CDAC out. was being used by quite a few. I, like seven or eight organizations. Yeah. <laughs> who would have thought it? Um, not no disrespect to what they're doing, but boy, are we jealous. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah share, share broadly, share it widely. Uh, we want you to. Yeah. We want you to. And to get the word out about the work that, that we're doing and how it relates to other topics of interest of you in your work, in your, in your uh, presence in, in, in the data universe. And Kim. it's very functionally. Uh, right now we're on camera at the Commerce Department's news channel. We're right now streaming right now on YouTube. Right. Okay, that's that's what I was going to ask. Okay. What's the YouTube channel? Commerce Department. Uh, it's uh, Commerce. I think it's at Commerce News specifically for Commerce YouTube, News. but okay. the Twitter handle is Commerce Gov. Uh, we're going through a, new, a few different channels right now. Okay. We're also the, the links are available on ESA.gov, mm -hmm. um, the CDAC webpage. That's where the CDAC webpage lives. That's where we will, we will be capturing all of the information from the meetings as we go forward. You can always get there to find out where you know if you need the agenda for the next meeting or whatever. Um, it'll be on on that webpage. Um, and we're also going to be putting together some, some we've already shot some videos with, with Mark Domes, the undersecretary, who will be here a little bit later, and, and Ian. I've asked for volunteers from this group to 
uh, do a couple of videos. We'd like to do five or six, and we're gonna, gonna put that together. We'll shoot that stuff out to you. We'll shoot the video that, you, that we do of you to you um, for you to use however you wish. Um, inappropriately, as Eric talked about in, in the capacity of the CDAC. Um, we're also uh, going to put together our own video that we'll be embedding in a, in a blog that Ian does at the end of this meeting. And uh, by the end of the next couple of meetings, I hope to have a video of every one of you. So we'll do five or six, hopefully, this time. I've got three volunteers so far. Um, and then we'll just move forward. But that's, that's another, another thought that we had. So. You want to take it? Yeah, OK. Uh, so before I get into the, some of the agenda, there are two people I'd like to thank. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, our host. So we're in Google's fine DC office. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you to and Google and, and Christopher Bono, uh, Bono, excuse me, for uh, mispronouncing the name for a second there. Thank you so much for hosting us. Uh, and of course, it's uh, uh, part of the future question about future events, I think, to Kim's question, uh, as to where we host the next one. Uh, that is also, I guess, uh, one of the things we'll, we'll decide as a team. Uh, later on this weekend. I'd also like to thank for the second person because she just stepped back in, Tanja White. Uh, Tanja, if you can wave, uh, none of us would be here if it wasn't for her. Uh, and so <laughs> she'll probably be continuing behind the, behind the scenes to make sure we're all fed and we know what the next, uh, the, the, the next speakers are, are, are prepped appropriately. But I just want to say thank you to, to Burton and Tanja for making all of this happen. So the agenda. Uh, we are hopeful that we have crafted a, uh, a party plan uh, to provide the maximum opportunity for us all to learn, uh, and at the same point to achieve the objectives of the charter, and even some specific objectives for this inaugural meeting. We want this to be an open, honest, clear uh, discussion about the state of the data economy and the role that the federal government, and specifically the Commerce Department, should play. Uh, on a very tactical level, I'm hopeful that after a couple of days, we get a top 10 list of the things that you all think we should do for the next couple of years. It may not seem like, uh, in, in fairness to all the great work that is being done across the entire public sector, it may not always seem like uh, government has perhaps the best customer service or perhaps the best customer response, but this is an opportunity for you to very literally tell us what we should do uh, to help the American people and how we should better empower uh, all, all uh, the businesses and organizations that rely on our information. And so this is your opportunity to put us to work in a very special and very fun way. And so we are very excited for that tasking and very excited for that, that those marching orders. Uh, and so we tried to craft uh, a bit of an outline to facilitate that. We will kick off uh, in, after lunch with uh, some brief remarks from uh, the Secretary of Commerce, Penny Pritzker. Uh, we are going to have a round of uh, Ignite talks, or Ignite inspired talks, I should say, uh, from six of the 12 bureaus from the Department of Commerce. Uh, we uh, have a bunch of volunteers who are eager to share a bit of the work that they're doing. And I will, I will talk about a bit more as to what the objective of those talks are specifically. But hopefully there's a few things that y you may not know about that will become evident from those talks, even if you've worked intimately with the Department of Commerce. Uh, after that, we're going to uh, have what I'll call the North Star discussion, an open opportunity for all of us in the big group to talk about the future of the data economy and how uh, we should evolve to meet that future. Uh, from that bigger discussion, we're going to break out into three small groups. And it's all going to be in this room, by the way. So basically, you know, well, three groups of eight members. Uh, the public will still be able to uh, observe these breakout groups. But that 90-minute section is really where the meat of the recommendations are going to come in. We have a few topical areas loosely to uh, frame those breakout groups. And we can you know, in, separate into those organically. But that's really where the meat of what should we go do is going to come out. We felt that it was hard to have that type of substantial discussion with 20 people around the table, just trying to make it easier to, to get into the details a little bit more. I should mention that, that those, those breakout discussions, we're just going to have a, a room shot for the live stream so they can see they're happening. They're not going to be recorded the same way mm -hmm. the discussions of all of us at, at the table are. We'll have note takers there who will just try to capture the flavor of the discussion. But again, they're not taped. Yep. Yep. And of course, nothing can get done without good flip charts and sticky notes. So we'll have there those standing by as well. Uh, the official events will basically conclude around 5 o'clock. And then there'll be some optional events uh, later this evening. Uh, we hope you all uh, are made those uh, events, uh, uh, that you're able to attend those events. Uh, tomorrow, we have, uh, again, some brief remarks uh, from other folks that are working hard uh, to drive the, leader, the, drive the data strategic initiatives uh, on behalf of the Department of Commerce. So we'll have that in the morning. Uh, and then basically after that, we're going to uh, offer up uh, an opportunity for some of you to share your own experiences about where you see 
the uh, data sector going. Basically 10 minutes each for the, I think it's actually six, five or six uh, members who have volunteered to share a few thoughts. Uh, after that, and this is, this is the, I guess, the grand finale. So we've, we've shared some ideas, we've dug into the details, we've given it some strategic uh, framework, we've talked about the future. And then we're gonna come down to what should we actually go do? And that is, again, one of the, one of the uh, aspirations I have for these two days is that there'll be a set of clear recommendations, marching orders, uh, going forward, not just for what the CDAC should do, but what should the Department of Commerce do? Um, and we can go into the mechanics of how we share those recommendations, but that, that again, that's part of the goals. That's part of the goals here is that we have some consensus around what those, what those recommendations should be. So that, that's an overview of the agenda. And any questions, Steve? I just wanted to ask a question about scope. Are we the only data advisory council? In the entire government? I think so. I think so. Yeah. And I say that because there's a tremendous number of copycats that are catching up now, and, and they're saying in, in, in the recommendations that they want, following the success of, huh. it's funny because we haven't done anything yet, but. Oh, that was <laughs> my next question. Will, yeah. will there be others for, uh, for other agencies? Well, I guess that's, well, uh, departments. I, I guess I hope there are, because I hope that what we demonstrate is so clear that it drives some degree of success elsewhere in other parts of the government. Um, now, in terms of scope, uh, I can, uh, I, am, I am a representative of the Department of Commerce. Uh, although I have curiosities, I'm just gonna make this up for the Department of Energy. Yeah. Um, that I think a fair question is whether or not that should be part of the scope. And I guess that's more of something that, you, that we hope to hear from you. Maybe I, I can give a hypothetical to prove the point. You can say, look, this isn't big enough. We need to include all federal agencies. Or you can say, you know what? you need to coordinate with other government agencies on things like this, this, and this. Like that actually is the scope definition. Well, you, that, the reason I ask is because you, you keep talking about the data economy. Mm -hmm. And even though the Commerce Department has jurisdiction over this business data interaction, I noticed there's some other colleagues here that I've, I think Bobby was here a minute ago and from the oh, USDA, from USDA. And, yeah. and Tyrone is here from GSA, right? Yeah. Um, Geo. Um, so, you know, they're obviously, whether they're here as interest to see what we're doing, does he have to craft their own, or mm -hmm. um, I just want to ask, you know, are, are we limited in scope to just commerce data, or are we? I guess technically no, but that's part of what we hope to discuss here is the ability for us to take some real actions. I guess I should be even more specific on the, the top 10 list. The top 10 things that folks like myself, our teams, the, the, the folks I work with, the Secretary of Commerce, that we can do, we'll say realistically, in the next few months and years. Uh, if it's a, a, a recommendation is, there needs to be one metadata standard for, or one, we'll say, one process or protocol that every federal, state, city, county government should deploy in the next six months, well, I think we can all fa it's fairly say it's just not gonna happen, right? So why not? Well, what are the, the elements underneath that? And so they, I think that's part of what we're hoping for with all of your experience is to have the realism uh, and the, the, the balance of where we know we need to go and also the effectiveness of the folks that are uh, available here. Now that said, um, the Secretary of Commerce is on a number of uh, cross-functional uh, teams. Uh, there are open data working groups throughout the federal government as well. We have San Francisco government represented here. Who even knows the collaboration opportunities between the federal government and San Francisco? Um, so I, I, there's, there are formal and informal ways to, I think, accomplish higher levels of scope if we so choose. Uh, but again, that, that, that's the fun part about this, this, this session. This is, we're the first ones. And only we're the first ones, it's our first meeting. So really, we are here to decide on the scope. More on scope, so the global economy is obviously global. Yes. Are you aware or are you in contact with other efforts in Europe or Asia or other areas that we should be aware of? The answer is yes. I think the, but the question should be, are we sufficiently connected? Uh, and as one arbitrary example, uh, and I'll, I'll go through this, we'll, we'll see a bit more of this later. There are 12 bureaus within the Department of Commerce. One of them is the International Trade Administration. They have, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as well, NOAA, NOAA and ITA have a global workforce. The American citizens are employed overseas. And so talk about global, that's our job, is to, to have that global vision. So yeah, the, the, I guess the short answer is yes, but again, what else should we be doing in that area? Do you think, is that a fair answer, do you think, Bernie? I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Actually, no, what I should be doing. I should be looking also at this. Well, I, I have an inclination to uh, introduce other folks that can help me answer some of these questions that are walking into the room, but I'm, I may be getting ahead of myself uh, too much. Again, at least for now, I wanted to share uh, the agenda as to what we hope to accomplish. I think a lot of the answers to your questions will basically uh, come up uh, at, at, with some more information and context uh, as we go through this. I'd just like to mention two other people. Um, Lynn Overman, the Deputy uh, just Chief Data you. Officer, Lynn, just arrived. And Austin Durer, the Chief of Staff of the Economics and Statistics Administration is over there. He's going to be moderating one of the discussions this afternoon. Um, and he'll be, he's very involved in this committee as well. I wanted to mention him. Um, oh, you know what, and I, I got so lost in the uh, recommendations, I forgot another part of the agenda, which is a rather important one. Public comment huh. at the <laughs> ironic. The, uh, at the end of our agenda, we have a dedicated portion where we will uh, facilitate uh, direct questions from the world uh, via, we have some mechanisms for that, Twitter and others, uh, but that is also an essential part of the agenda. Right. Other questions or comments? Okay, why don't we um, break for lunch now? It's a working lunch and we are encouraging all of us to, to huddle and talk and keep this conversation that just got started going. Um, the cafeteria is actually off limits to us. That's Google's place, but there's areas around the corner and then we can come back to this table or this room. The food will be right around the corner, food and drinks and such. So help yourself to lunch and we will reconvene formally uh, a little before one o'clock and begin, begin our work together in the most formal way. So thanks all.
So the secretary will be here in a few minutes. Um, so we'll be getting started, but not quite just yet. But I'm glad to see that all you folks on the committee are here around the tables. That's perfect. So I'll let you know when, when we're going to get underway.
So, so we can get started. Um, we're pleased to have Secretary Pritzker here to join us. I'm going to turn it over to Mark Domes, the Under Secretary of Commerce for Economic Affairs, and he's going to kick off our afternoon and the beginning of the substantive work of this council. Mark. Good afternoon. Thank you all for taking out time out of your busy schedules to join us for <laughs> this, the inaugural meeting of the Commerce Department's new Data Advisory Council. We'd like to thank Google for being such gracious and generous host. You are leaders in the data space, and it's awesome to be in the same room with you. We greatly appreciate your commitment to this council and to our department's mission to more fully realize the value of our data, to foster innovation, create jobs, and drive better decision making. As Undersecretary for Economic Affairs to the Department of Council, I have the privilege of overseeing two of our data agencies, the U.S. Census Bureau and the Bureau of Economic Analysis. But I'm here today because Secretary Pritzker asked me to lead the department's data agenda and you pillar of the department's strategic plan. One thing many people do not fully appreciate is just how much data commerce produces. We produce high quality comprehensive data on our ever changing climate, on our oceans, on our population, on our economy, on our innovation systems, and the list goes on. I like to say we've been doing big data before big data was cool. In fact, our census and patent data go back to 1790, when API meant all paper index. <laughs> Upon entering office, Secretary Pritzker made data one of her strategic priorities, the first, Commerce Secretary, the first Commerce Secretary ever to do so. Why? Because data innovation is revolutionizing every aspect of our society. And here at Commerce, it's our job to act as a responsible accelerator for this revolution, because the benefits to our society can be so large. So with that said, we'd like to go around the table and if everybody could just very briefly introduce themselves to the secretary and we'll go counterclockwise starting to my right. Joy Ponegoro, Chief Data Officer, City and County of San Francisco. Uh, Bill Gale, uh, co-founder of Global Weather Corporation and past president of the American Meteorological Society. Thank you for joining us at our meeting here earlier this week. Cardi Borna, Indiana University. Jack Dangerman with ESRI. Brian Schimpf, Palantir Technologies. Heather Joseph from Spark. William Kutze, PayPal. Stan Humphrey's Chief Economist at Zillow. Colin Paris, General Electric. CJ Moses from Amazon Web Services. Kevin Merritt, Founder and CEO of Socrata. Kim Stevenson, CIO at Intel. Alan Blue from LinkedIn. Steve Adler with IBM. Karen Remington, Arjuna Solutions. Daniel Castro, Center for Data Innovation. Dana Boyd, Microsoft Research and Data and Society. Chris Bono with Google. Okay. I'd now like to turn the microphone over to Secretary Pritzker, who, as I noted a moment ago, is the real reason why we're here today. Mm -hmm. She understands firsthand the value of government data to the business community, having used census data to strategically locate establishments in one of her many businesses. We're fortunate to have her expertise and energy at the helm. She's invigorated the department, putting us on a forward-leaning path in many areas, particularly in data. We thank her for her vision and her leadership in this space. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Secretary Pritzker. Mark, thank you very much. Well, first of all, my response is wow. Uh, when I first arrived and we as a leadership team were talking about what are the priorities for the Department of Commerce, it just seemed natural to me that we had all this inventory, uh, to use a retail phrase, of data and that we we couldn't possibly be doing the most that we it was possible with it. And here we are now, um, uh, probably a year later or so, with a great team. So I'm really fortunate, Mark, thank you to have you involved. Uh, Ian, as our uh, newest member of our team, coming on as our chief data officer. Lynn Overman, who's been amazing working at the White House and as our deputy chief data officer. And so 
first, I'm excited that we actually have a team focused on this issue at the Department of Commerce. But I could not have imagined when the idea of a data council was proposed that we would also get all of you engaged. And so the quality and talent around the table and around the room is just a bit overwhelming to me, but really exciting. Um, we th would like to think of ourselves as America's data agency. And because of the depth, the breadth, and the reach of our data, as Mark talked about, you know, everything from time, we measure time, <laughs> to GDP, uh, to personal income, to population, uh, to information about the depths of the ocean, to all the way up to the sun. So it is, we're full of valuable information. And the challenge that we have is, is it collected appropriately? Is it organized right? Are we analyzing it right? Are we using it for the, pro the potential purposes? And it's got to be the answer to that is, we're falling short of the potential. And that's why you're here. You're here to help us figure that out. We need your advice. We need your recommendations. How do we best improve our data management practices? How do we develop common open data standards? How do we build effective models for good you know, public-private partnerships? How do we expand the external use of com commerce data? How do we enhance communication between non-government stakeholders and subject matter experts at the Department of Commerce. Those are just questions we can think of. I suspect you all could think of even more. Um, you know, we, the reason we asked you to join this group and that we're delighted that you've agreed to, frankly, serve your country and help us, is um, we need your input. We need your guidance to better anticipate what are the needs of businesses how do we better deliver data in a more usable, timely, accessible way? Um, how do we improve how our data is utilized to make business and government more effective and efficient? Um, so the question that I want you to keep in your mind as you're going through this process, and again, I will tell you, I know it's you've committed significant time, and I appreciate that. I want you to know we appreciate that. The question is, Think of yourself as a steward of the taxpayer's dollars, right? A steward of the taxpayer's asset. Now what should we do? How do we do this in a way? What do we do with these assets that we have that we produce for one reason or another because we're mandated to do? But there's much greater purpose to which they can be put. Do we do it for free? Do we charge for it? Do we partner? Do we, um, how do we make it more available? I mean, these are all, it's all on the table. There's not uh, parameters to thinking about this. We're at the beginning of what I would call a startup. I don't think it's reasonable to think in our term um, that we're gonna figure all this out and it's all gonna be done. But what you have the, you have the potential to do here is lay the foundation for how does the federal government think about the public good called data. And what should we be doing and what's responsible for us to do? So it's a bit of take off your parochial hat in your, from your business, put on your hat as a steward of um, the public good of the taxpayer and say, what should we be doing? What's our responsibility? And you guys are the experts. I mean, we have experts, but we can no way have the diversity of perspective that you have. And that's why we you know, are so thrilled that you're here. Um, you know, what I would ask you to do as you're considering all kinds of questions that you will consider, like should the government focus on raw wholesale data or apps, you know, how should we evolve to maintain protections of privacy, confidentiality, and security in the dissemination of our data? We have to take those things into account. Um, what can we do to foster the best technical skills and data resources without competing with companies like yours? We're not looking to compete. We don't even believe that's, that's not in our lexicon. What our, we want to do is collaborate. We view you as our customers and as our partners. And so what we're here to do is also listen to you as customers. But frankly, we're going to need guidance because there's no way we have the expertise 
the depth of expertise that we probably need given the volume of what we have. I'll tell you one thing that we did that some of you I think are aware of is that this week NOAA launched a public-private partnership to release more of its environmental and weather data, uh, working with Amazon, working uh, with IBM, Microsoft, Google Cloud Services, and the University of Chicago's um, Cloud uh, Center. You know, should we take similar approaches to that? Should we, you know, is that a good idea what we did? We need your advice. And so think about, you know, my challenge to you is as follows. Think about what are the top 10 list of things you would want us to focus on, given that we have to keep in mind the political leadership here has, you know, probably 20 months in front of us. And we're, there's a lot we can get done, um, but we probably can't boil the ocean. We can't do everything. So think of your recommendations, think of your ideas in short, medium, and long term. Think of top 10, where would you focus us right now? Who do we partner with? And that will be more, most valuable to us. Don't leave it to us to figure that out. Use your, help us with that. Um, so all I can say is we can get a lot done in a very short period of time. As you can tell, our team is highly motivated and highly energized to really move the needle in the period of time that we have. The second thing we are highly energized about is to make this a sustainable part of the Department of Commerce, so we need your guidance on that. What should exist at the Department of Commerce? Because the use of data isn't going away. It's only going to become more so. And so we have to lay down a foundation that is carried forward. Um, so a lot to do in the next two days a lot to do in the next two years, um, but uh, we're so grateful that you're going along on this journey with us. And don't forget, this is, I've sat in your position, I've been on a council, and it's, you can make a huge difference. I sat on the President's Jobs Council. We only did work for about a year and made it just, we, we had huge influence. You can have huge influence in this role if you engage. And I would submit it's the moment because you've got really receptive people on the other side in the government who want to figure this out. So um, I'm really excited to hear from all of you. I know that um, I'm not going to be quiet because there's going to be presentations, but this is a really you're at the ground floor of something that I think has a fantastic potential, not just for the Department of Commerce, but we could set an example for the federal government. And it's really also about the idea that working with the private sector, we're much better, as opposed to you guys complaining and us feeling beleaguered. That's, <laughs> we much prefer the let's collaborate and try and figure this out together. So I appreciate your willingness to commit time to serve your country, which is what you're doing, and to um, help us be the best that we can be. So thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, Secretary Pritzker, thank you so much for those remarks and for your leadership. So what's going to happen next? We have something a little fun. We, of course, want to make sure that we can provide a proper introduction, but there are roughly 50,000-ish people at the Department of Commerce, so that take a while. Instead of that, we're going to have a Ignite style or Ignite inspired set of talks. There, uh, we have some representatives who will introduce themselves and their bureaus. They have been uh, briefed that they have exactly and no more than five minutes per person from six bureaus that will be presenting here. Uh, they have a, a few stories to share and then afterwards we'll open up for some uh, comments and questions from everyone here. Uh, for those on the front side of this table, you may have to adjust your chairs a little bit, uh, but I will also be close to the presenters to be the judge and jury. If some of them decide to go along, we will get the appropriate inspiration to pass the baton to the next presenter. And so with that, I will turn it over to the Census Bureau. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeannie Schiffer. I'm the Associate Director of Communications for the Census Bureau. And for the next five minutes, I will talk to you about data-driven marketing. Now, what does a bureaucrat know about data-driven marketing? Well, I contend, contend that the 2020 decennial census will be a marketing challenge unlike any that your organizations will ever face. And here's why. 
commercial marketing associations try to target particular segments of the population in particular geographies. Here at the Census Bureau, we must count every person in America in the right place at pretty much the same time. Young households, old households, rural households, urban households, all of the households, 320 million people. How many of your marketing organizations have to count all of the people in America at the same time? In 2020, households will respond online or by mail or by phone. We will educate and promote response in even more ways, including digital advertising, TV, radio, print, partnerships, and social media. We have to create a personalized experience at the lowest possible cost while making it safe and easy for the people who are responding. With so many variables, how do we know what's working? That's why we're conducting a test in the Savannah, Georgia media market. And that's why we built the Census Performance Management Tool. And here's how it works. It's an interactive visualization tool sitting on top of one centralized data warehouse. Responses by geography, demographics, social media, partnership activity, media spend, and more. By evaluating all of our metrics in one place, we can make sure that everybody is encouraged to respond in a, the most effective way possible for their community and that everyone gets counted. And the 2015 census test is just the start. We will build on this capability as we approach the year 2020. So let's fast forward to 2020 and let's try to imagine how this will work. The census response team will get real-time data from the 2020 census in one place. So I'm from Georgia, shocker, you probably couldn't tell. And let's say in this example that the team has identified a low response rate back home. So we spring into action using the data warehouse and analytical tools, customer service data, and we'd say, what's working? What's not working? And what's the buzz in the community? Well, we find anti-government sentiment. We're seeing it in social media. We're hearing about it on the radio and on TV, and I'm hearing about it on the phone from my cousins. <laughs> the digital ads that have been effective in other rural areas, they're not working here. Uh-oh. There is low partnership engagement. And based upon these findings, a plan is put in place with specific messages and targeting. Our digital ads are updated using trusted local voices, like a minister or a Braves player, go Braves. Digital ad buys are shifted to mediums with more real estate for personalized messages like Facebook or shareable videos. We change the search terms we're purchasing to deliver more targeted results. So let's see how this experience would work for my pretend friend, Gina. Gina is 42. She lives in Putnam County, Georgia. She has two kids and a husband, and she does not like the government. Now, I want to be clear, we're not targeting Gina or anybody else. We will use demographic and geographic characteristics to place highly segmented ads. So, Gina sees a sponsored Facebook ad, and there's her Braves player, and she's a diehard fan. So she clicks on the ad, which takes her to fill out her census online, but she's skeptical. So she Googles, 2020 census, is this real? She clicks to respond. At every step, Gina's actions are aggregated with other respondents that share her demographic and geographic characteristics. And back at the Census Bureau, we continue to improve the messages and the operational activities until we are sure that we are effectively and efficiently counting every person like Gina. The result is a customer-centric, data-driven decennial where everyone is counted. On time, thank you. Thanks, y'all. Next, we will hear from the Patent and Trademark Office. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Ajay Kandaria, Senior Advisor at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. 
And as you can see from the slide behind me, the PTO is celebrating 225 years of open data this year. Um, that may sound a bit surprising. It may sound like we've been sitting on the invention for the time machine. But as Mark mentioned earlier, we've been doing this since 1790. And uh, if you'll indulge me for a second, I'm going to give you a quick primer on patent law, which I realize may sound like something of a uh, recurring nightmare for some people, but think about how patents work. You invent something new, and you get the exclusive rights to that invention for a limited time, but you have to do something in return. You have to show everyone else how that invention works, and that's what a patent is. It's a government publication that shows everyone how the invention works, and it lets them know that they can't use it, for, at least not for now. And that encourages people to build on that knowledge from that invention and to come up with what might be better alternatives. But this only works if the PTO is getting its data out to the public. By the way, don't try to go out and practice patent law with that. It's a little more complicated. So open data is at the very heart of the PTO's mission to foster innovation. We recognize that. It's why we've made a commitment to open data, not just as another thing we do, but as a priority for the agency. We recognize that today, open data doesn't just serve as a guide to inventors and businesses serving to, serving to uh, protect their brands. Our data already serves as the foundation for many businesses that add value to our data and repackage it and deliver it to customers. And we believe that as we improve our data delivery, there's room to do even more with PTO's data. For example, combining data about published patent applications with data about federal grants allows researchers to measure the impact of federal R&D on regional economies. So our open data strategy is about creating solutions, and it has three parts. First, we want to improve how we deliver data. Now, not too long ago, we used to send bulk updates of our data to subscribers on CD-ROMs, and it's really a handful of subscribers. I think we sent about seven a year. Today, our data is available for free through a web interface, and we're serving thousands of unique users but we think our data could be reaching more people. So we want to make it easier for the public to find our data, to access our data, and then to have it available to them in a more usable format than we do now. And so we've undertaken an inventory to find out what data sets we have, um, and we've developed a framework to deliver our most in-demand data sets via API over the next couple of years, with the goal to have all of our data sets ultimately available in that way. I am also relieved to not have to define API or sell you on their value. Um, second, we want to engage with the people that use our data. Not just people who use our data today, but people who may use it in the future. We think the best way to guide the delivery of our data is by finding out what our users find useful and where we have room to improve. Last December, in conjunction with NYU's GovLab, we had our first open data roundtable. It brought together the broadest range of users, from academics to patent applicants, from people that had used our data for a long time to people who'd never used it. And we had a day-long conversation about our plans for data delivery. Outside of this room, that may sound incredibly tedious, but it was a great time for us. While we have all sorts of ideas about what we want to do to deliver our data better, we want to focus our efforts on what our users think is useful. We have a limited amount of resources and a limited amount of time as Ian is pointing out right now. So <laughs> finally, uh, I just want to close by saying we want to, the last thing we want to do is innovate in data delivery. So we want to tap into the enthusiasm of the open data community and really promote the uh, use of our data. So we're going to where the users are. We set up a GitHub site for developers. We're looking at ho hosting our first hackathons and data jams. And we've tapped the enthusiasm of our, of our workforce at PTO. We have a diverse workforce. We're really proud of that, and we have a diversity of interests, too. We also have over 8,000 engineers, so you can see where this is going. We now have an affinity group at PTO called CODE, the Club for Open Data Enthusiasts, and they're, they're serving as a bridge between PTO and the open data community, and we've never had that before. So we're being innovative in our approach to open data. I hope you will hold us to that, because I spoke about the virtuous cycle of open data and innovation. That's our mission, and uh, that's what, we, that's what we're really going to be doing here. Thank you. And up next, we have the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Good afternoon. My name is Lucas Hitt, and I'm from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Today, I want to tell you a little bit about what my bureau does, how that's changed over the last few years, and then some of the fascinating challenges we look forward to working with you on and questions we'd like to solve. 
So BEA is the, the, is the statistical agency that estimates many of the key economic indicators you're familiar with. Our flagship product is gross domestic product and its industry and regional variations. Collectively, this work is known as national accounting, and it's a strict set of framework and, and parameters uh, that we use to assemble data and, and, and measure the economy. And it traces its roots back to work done at the, at the department in the 1930s. I like to think of the national accounts as big data analytics back before we had big data analytics. In the days before high-speed computational power, the structure and the framework of the national accounts provided the means to assemble and analyze disparate data so that we could produce a consistent set of measures over time. Today, the national accounts continue to be the primary mean, means of understanding the economy and providing the operational economic data that businesses, governments, and households alike depend on. But this evolution has, has, has a long arc over about 80 years. The economy is this ever-changing entity, and thus measuring it is, requires constant change. But first, let's talk for a second about how we do this. BEA is first and foremost a data aggregator. On a monthly basis, we consume millions of data points from nearly a dozen other federal agencies, hundreds of state and local governments, trade groups, private sector data partners, as well as our own surveys. And all of this is then com compiled and integrated into the national accounts and then published in full each month. This gives BEA this interesting perspective, as we are, in economic speak, the downstream actor, consuming data from our peers and our private sector partners to assemble the national accounting framework and key indicators such as GDP. But as I noted earlier, this evolution has been long term. And it remains in constant flux. Major de developments have been driven by the needs for war planning, concerns about inflation, the rise of globalization, the puzzle of quality-adjusted computer prices, and the drive to understand the role of intangibles in our economy. And this evolution continues today. Just this year, BEA has put out three new analytical series, quarterly GDP by industry, regional price parities, and personal income measures across states and metro areas, and consumer spending by state. Each of these series represents a new, new insight into our dynamic economy and, frankly, that much more data to get into the hands of our users. But as our work has evolved, so have our customers. Today, BEA's customers include basically anyone with the interest and the means to access our website. And today's customers want interactive data, mapping, visualizations, machine-readable files, and, of course, faster and in more detail than ever before. Moreover, we get it that the average data consumer doesn't have BEA.gov bookmarked in their browser. Rather, they want to know the GDP of Colorado. They probably go to Google and type GDP of Colorado. Uh, and so we have that additional challenge of how to communicate. But this has not always been the case. For much of our history, the only way users consumed our data was through our monthly journal, the Survey of Current Business. Then BEA went online in the 1990s. In 2002, we launched our first interactive data tool, which it left a few things to be desired. And then in 2011, we launched our current award-winning interactive data tool, which combined mapping, graphing, and charting tools with a single, single system and uniform, uniformity. And even as I stand here now, our team is back at hard at work trying to envision the new BEA.gov and a complete restructuring of our information architecture, new data tools, and wholesale change to try to align what we do with our customers' needs of today. But all that said, we recognize that there's a whole lot about this we don't know, and that's where we look forward to working with you. Open data presents a really interesting frontier from our perspective, but how do we best translate the, the national accounting structure into the open data environment? Likewise, big data presents interesting opportunities to either su supplement or possibly even fully supplant traditional data sources, as well as how do we best position BEA's data itself as a big data asset? And then data dissemination in the modern environment provides both a well of opportunity as well as a range of fascinating challenges. Markets react. Markets react. <laughs> Security is paramount and symmetry is essential. Thank you. <laughs> but for me, yeah. for, for me, the most pressing challenge is ensuring that we're providing the best, most accurate, and relevant timely data we can to our customers. This chart represents that challenge for my mind. The vertical axis is familiarity with BEA's products and data, and the horizontal axis is economic knowledge. I can tell you we feel relatively comfortable talking to the customers in the blue. These are our traditional customers. The yellow customers I think we owe a fair amount more effort to, and the green customers represent our biggest opportunity to fulfill both our mission as well as Secretary Pritzker's challenge to fully leverage the department's data assets. So with that, and on behalf of my colleagues back at BEA, we look forward to working with you on these questions in the coming months and years. Thank you.
next we will hear from Michelle at our organization we call NTIS. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Williams. I'm one of many program managers with the National Technical Information Service. And I have the pleasure of sharing with you today how NTIS supported USCIS with the challenge of decrypting data. Our perspective is going to be a little bit different than the other bureaus you've heard because we actually have a very close relationship in working with the private sector. We actually have a unique authority to build public and private partnerships and currently we have over 50 of them. At NTIS, we view challenges as opportunity. So UT, USCIS came to us with the problem, USCIS. United States Immigration Services, thank you. They came to us with the problem of relaying information to the public, finding ways to do it efficiently and maximizing their resources. They also shared that the public was very challenged with locating information on their website and understanding it once they found it. We had to make changes and make them quickly. So we quickly called together a whiteboarding team to come up with some ideas. And we continued the collaboration with USCIS and our joint venture partner, Excella, to develop and deploy a solution within 90 days. And that's correct, 90 days. A solution that supports the presidential initiative to improve customer service, a solution that supports the Paper Reduction Act, and a solution that's fiscally responsible. So we'll delve a little bit more into the collaboration. USCIS definitely had the vision of what they wanted to accomplish. They worked with IDEO and at and to work on the concept and the user experience design. But the question was, how would this application come to fruition? Fortunately, the NTIS team with our partners Excel were able to step up to the plate, develop and deploy the solution. We use an agile approach. The team truly came together to problem solve, innovate, rapid deliver, and develop. It's okay to make changes with our process. The entire process is agile from the moment you establish an agreement, government to government, to the point of delivery. We're using the latest tech agile technologies uh, with two week development sprints. We are absolutely comfortable with urgent changes. In fact, we can release a change to production within 60 minutes. Voila, the final result. You have a robust federal information management system. It's successful, it's so successful. In fact, I have an 11 year old and she was helping a girlfriend of hers at school to research answers to her family's challenge from Ghana uh, at the tip of her fingers with her mobile device. So you can explore options on the site. And finally, search, explore, apply. So literally at the tip of your fingers, you can log on right now. It's my.uscis.gov. And we're enabling information to the public without being charged for this data. So really, truly, this information was quick, but trust that it is unique. In fact, the USCIS team was able to release this new application to production at a tenth of the budget. We are really proud in supporting them and look forward to opportunities to support your agencies. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, since there's actually a minute and a half to spare, I'll give a quick and unscripted editorial to that great work. Uh, I, uh, I'm very grateful for all of you that can be very patient with government acronyms. We can't help but use them. But I will say that although, in my personal opinion, Maybe a phrase like myuscis.gov does not roll off the tongue with poetry. It is already one of the most popular websites in the federal government. And we have the data to prove it. That even that brand, which doesn't necessarily have that musical <laughs> ring, is already serving many, many people to live the American dream and become citizens of our country. So it's with that extra uh, accolade that I'm very uh, uh, proud and be part of the team, uh, joining the team rather, uh, that built this great product. And again, congratulations to the great work at that bureau. So that's the extra minute editorial. I now, back to the calendar, uh, would like to introduce the International Trade Administration. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Kim Beck, and I'm with the International Trade Administration, and I'm here today to talk to you about our trade developer portal, where our goal is to help U.S. companies export. So this is our trade developer portal. We include data not only from our agency, ITA, but also from our sister trade agencies such as the Small Business Administration, the Export-Import Bank, the State Department, and many others. This is built for developers, so our APIs are available in JSON format, and we're using a GitHub repository to collect feedback. 
We also have a common taxonomy that we use across all of our data sets to make our data more easy to consume. We also didn't just want to make this techie. We're also friendly for our non-techie folks that come to our site. For each data set, we include information on why this data matters, ideas for using the data, and a demo search app so you can search the data without having to know JSON or how to program. So why we did it, the data on our website, as many other sites, was cumbersome to access. You had to know where it was, you had to manually manipulate, and you had to check back for updates. So we want to create new data products and services that deliver added value to our customers and exponentially increase our customer base. So we have essential data that we want to get into the global supply chain where trade and investment decisions are made. No one should have to scour websites looking for it. And our data should be available on demand when the decisions need to be made. So for example, we have the consolidated screening list, which I'll get into in a minute. And if we can get that into logistic systems of, say, major international shippers, this could help prevent exporters from doing business with the wrong people. This could help them avoid costly fines. So this is what I just mentioned, our consolidated screening list. Before we put this together, which made bad guy, catching bad guys much easier now, you had to know about two downloadable files. One was a CSV and the other was a text file. You had to manually download it. You had to manually scan it. You had to register for a, um, an email list so you'd know when it was updated. And then you had to come back and get the update and start all over again. So we needed to make this easier so that exporters would no longer unknowingly do business with prohibited entities. If they integrate this directly into their supply chain software, they'll know right away who they can and can't do business with. This is also our first data set where we reach outside our agency. We work with the departments of commerce, state, and treasury. And we also have other federal agencies that are also consuming our data now. So there's one bureau within the Department of State that provides us with screening information. And we have another bureau also within the Department of State that uses our API to incorporate it into their own screening software. Business USA also uses a lot of the data sets that we have available on our portal. So now we're starting to look beyond our web pages and our search apps to find data that we can use from other areas inside our agency as well as from our sister agencies. So we started small. We started with the data sets that we had available on our website. And that would be the market research library, our trade events, trade leads, our ITA offices and centers, and our trade news articles. So we started reaching out to incorporate the other information from the other agencies. And one of the big ones for us there is our trade events. We included information from the Export Import Bank, Small Business Administration, the US Trade and Development Agency, and the State Department's direct line. We harmonize the data on that common taxonomy, and we publish it out as a single feed so customers don't have to go to all those different agencies to find out when the events are happening. We also maintain constant contact with those agencies to make sure that the data is always up to date. We recently released our version two of our APIs, and with version two, we added two new data sets, one on the tariff rates for all free trade agreements, and we also added our frequently asked questions for exporters. We added overseas opportunities to our FedBiz Ops trade lead, from FedBiz Ops to our trade leads. And then we introduced API keys. So this will help us keep better track of who's using the data so we know how to help people better. So I'd like to thank you for your time this afternoon. This is my contact information. If you have any questions would like to follow up later, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. And last but certainly not least, we have uh, Brian from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Brian Eiler. I'm a senior advisor. And I am here to talk about the NOAA Big Data Project. Um, we were very excited to have the secretary announce this project uh, on Tuesday morning at the American Meteorological Society. and. Uh, and it's something that uh, we have a lot of ambition for. Uh, 
maybe it makes sense to talk very briefly about NOAA. I will spare you the mission. But uh, in shorthand, we are in the uh, business of environmental intelligence. And to do that, we collect over 2 billion observations a day. We have 120 radar networks in every state and territory, four buoy networks with hundreds of buoys in every ocean on the planet. We have uh, hundreds of automated ground platforms, 200 tide gauges, 8,000 river gauges, 17 ships, 10 aircraft, 10 satellites, geos geostationary and polar orbiting, and one that is currently speeding its way to L1, 1.5 million miles from Earth. All that means a lot of data. T we say at least 20 terabytes. It's probably closer to 30 or even 40. And we archive most of that data. So if you look at that chart, by the time we get to 2030, we're going to have roughly 3,000 petabytes, which is a lot of data. And of course, this is the data that provides the basis for every weather forecast in the country, not only for the American, uh, for the Ameri uh, American Weather Service, uh, but the National Weather Service, sorry, but also the uh, entire private weather industry, which is a multi-billion dollar industry. Every port in the country uh, runs smoothly because of our data. Uh, it enables coastal communities to plan for the future, and it guides the stewardship of uh, all the nation's fisheries. Now, for all that data, the public acts has only ready access to a small percentage. We say ready access uh, because um, you can actually get to a lot of our data, but it's not in a meaningful or useful way. Let me, um, can you go back one? Yes. Thanks. Did we miss a slide? All right, that's all right. Uh, we uh, have ready access to a small percentage. Let me give you one example. There's something called VIRS data. That is visual and infrared data that's used to measure cloud properties, ocean color, surface temperature, ice, uh, air temperature, fires. It's very important to our weather and climate models. And uh, the private industry would love to have it. And technically, they can get it. If you just go onto our FTP server, you can download it. The catch is, if you try to download that particular product, it takes more than 24 hours to download 24 hours worth of data, which means you can never catch up. You can never be current, and you can't do it in real time. And the reason why is we have over 400 facilities and 200 data centers, including the National Climatic Environmental Protection Centers, the National Data uh, Climatic Centers, the Oceanographic Data Center, the Geophysical Data Center. We have five supercomputers in Orlando, Reston, Oak Ridge, Fairmont, and Boulder. And there is no common data aggregator platform for any of it. Uh, and moving around it is a burden. Internally, we move two petabytes every month just to facilitate our predetermined uh, mission operations. So even if you know, even if you want to use our data, it's hard to know where to find it. And uh, if we're relying on people who only know exactly where to find it, that really closes off uh, avenues for innovation. So we are enlisting help. We want to position our data so the private industry and the American public can have all all great access to all of our data. We want as many institutions and people as possible to have uh, access to virtually all of our data. We want the public to see the same data we're seeing with the same level of detail at the same time. And we want the public to drive the demand and decide which data sets are more important. So we went about trying to figure out how to do that. And we started about a year ago. We did a first RFI in February. We did a second RFI in September. And we had an industry day in October. We had 73 respondents to our RFIs, and we had over 300 individuals come to our campus in Silver Spring in October, representing over 200 companies. We had a lot of interest, but the takeaway was no single ba business model emerged as the clear solution. And the reason is no one company understood the entire ecosystem of all the data users, stagers, collectors. We as a government aren't in the business of being uh, a customer provider in a commercial basis for this data. The end users of the data understand the data, but they don't have the scale to manage all that data. And cloud providers don't have a ready use for that data. And the marketplace is not very mature because NOAA is the only one who collects all this data, and we've never disseminated it on this scale before. So we realized we need to work together to develop a marketplace to maturity. We need a program that organizes the entire e ecosystem, us as the collectors of the data, those who stage it, and ultimately those who use and innovate the data. So we came up with the idea of data alliances. As the Secretary announced this week, 
we have signed cooperative research and development agreements to collaborate with Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, IBM, Microsoft Azure, and the, op uh, and the Open Cloud Consortium from the University of Chicago. We call them our project anchors. We interface with them, and they interface with the rest of the marketplace. Each anchor organizes a data alliance, and they work with us to identify which data sets are of most importance to the public. They also work with us to help us address the technical challenges of, move, of bringing all of our data to the cloud. All right, so we're just going to screen through all this. This is an early architectural concept. You get an idea of kind of how it works its way up through. But if you'll allow me just to extend a metaphor, what this whole thing really is is one big invitation to play in our sandbox. And we've been trying to do that for a while and, and had some challenges until we realized our issue is we don't have a sandbox. What we have in this extended metaphor is a lot of sand. If that's our data, we have mountains, deserts full of sand, but no platform where everyone can play. Our anchors have a sandbox. And in this metaphor, they also have tools to play with sand. So added value services, uh, private data storage, computing power, positioned right next to all our great data on their cloud. And if we can figure out a way to bring our sand to their sandbox, then we possibly we have a way that everyone can play. So this is also about building a new kind of relationship between government and industry. This is a new kind of project. This has never been tried, as far as we can tell, ever before in the federal government. And we realized if we take a traditional approach of just setting our requirements, contracting out, and walking away, it's just not going to work. So this is about getting to know each other over time. We learn about industry's need. Industry learns about our, our capabilities and our data. It's not prescriptive. Each alliance sets its own goals. So with the CRADA, uh, we have a... Okay, one more. One more. So with the CRADA, uh, we have a statement of objectives. It lays forth what our principles are, but we try to make it as flexible as possible. We only have two core principles. One, no exclusive access to NOAA data. Second, equal access to NOAA data on equal terms. The idea here is that this is a public good, our data, and Government can't be in the position to pick winners or losers or um, allow the market. All right, I'm getting the cut sign. Let me just say this real quick. We're, re we're researching everything we can, not only on the technical side, but the business side. And we have a lot of great work to do, and we're looking forward to doing it. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, everyone who presented. Uh, okay, a lot of presentations in a short period of time, right? I hope you've recognized at this point that there is a tremendous amount of data work going on within this department. Some of it probably you already knew about, but my hunch is there's some stuff here that you had not heard before. So we have a few minutes. Uh, are there any questions, comments, or concerns that you'd like to share with our inspired Ignite presenters? I'll start with the, 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 the this is a question, by the way, is directed to the members of the council, members of the table. Any questions? Any feedback? Anything you'd like to share? I really like to see a lot of open data, open code. Are you also considering open education? Because oftentimes you need a little bit of hand-holding to actually make that new data and these new code pieces work together. That's a great question. I will defer to anyone, any of our NI presenters uh, uh, care to respond to that question. Yeah, please. So with our trade data, or our trade developer portal, we do have a team that works with individuals and companies that are looking to use our data. And they help walk them through the process. And we get a lot of feedback that way. So if there's a way we can improve our data, like if we have first name and last name together in one field and it would really work for them better separated, we work with them to make that happen. We really want to have our data as available to our customers as possible. And whenever we make a change, we also let all of our customers know and we do get a lot of feedback via our GitHub repository. So we try to work really close with, with the customers using our information. Uh, any other questions from the members? Yeah, please. How do you guys work between each other? Are you mm -hmm. guys sharing different strategies and tactics? You each have your different initiatives, but how do you collaborate uh, as you're learning different ways of going about this? Uh, so maybe I'll start to answer that question, and I'll also turn it over. Uh, I would say that there are lots of ways, uh, but there's a uh, tremendous room for improvement. 
Uh, I would categorize them in my first month of joining the department. There's basically three buckets of how we do that. There's the, the people, the processes, and the tools. People side, uh, I would say that a lot of the folks that are here rep from our department actually know each other and have a natural way of connecting and asking questions, teaching each other, sharing best practices. From a process perspective, there's a few working groups and a few councils. Uh, I would also say that although we have only half of the bureaus physically represented here, even within each bureau, there's probably some great opportunities and great examples of coordination and collaboration, but also some silos that painfully exist. And then from a technology perspective, there are some collaboration tools that we use. GitHub is a, is a classic, highly visible example of that. But there's also the technology to be able to uh, share information. You have your shared folders and your shared drives and your shared points and things like that. Uh, and that is uh, individually uh, deployed by each of the bureaus in, in a general sense. But I'll, I'll say with some uh, honesty that there is uh, perhaps more that can be done at the department-wide level. And so that's, yeah, so the, the people processes and tools is how we approach it. Uh, are there anyone else would like to add to that before we lose? Oh, yes. I, I would just say, um, you know, in general, one of the challenges we face as the Department of Commerce is working across the agencies. We've worked hard to try and break that down, but I'd love any thoughts, ideas, creative solutions to continue that effort because there's a lot of, uh, that we can do as we take our data sets and put them on top of each other. We've seen that, for example, at the Economic Development Agency. We've done a project with uh, Harvard where we're looking at, at uh, locating businesses. And all, as you might imagine, if you're trying to locate a business, if you had census data, education data, supply chain data, weather data, et cetera, et cetera, and they, you could actually visualize those maps it would be much easier for a business, new business into the United States to figure out where the heck to put your next plant or whatever. Um, we, have this, we have that problem in the department. We're consciously trying to address it, but honestly, we could use all good ideas. Is that fair? No, oh, absolutely. And that one example, by the way, if you just search on your favorite search provider for cluster maps, cluster mapping, that, that'll be one of the projects that the secretary just mentioned. So yeah, I think we're actually, yeah, we're out of time. So thank you all to the presenters uh, from the, uh, the nights in different bureaus. Thank you to the secretary. And yeah, we'll. I will see you all tonight at the reception. Okay. So we're going to take a short break here. We'll take a short break and come back in five minutes.
So let's get rolling. I know you're all in great conversations, but let's come back to the table and get started again. We'll have another break at 3.15 after this session. So. We need to get started again. I'm going to use the gavel if I have to. All right, I'm going to ask the people in the audience to wrap up their conversations. We need to get started again. I promise well, there's another break to get back to those conversations coming soon. So we're moving into a roundtable discussion that, that Ian's going to moderate. I'm going to ask the members of the committee, when you want to talk, turn your name tag up like that. I'll keep track of it. And Ian will call on you in the order that you turn that up to the best that I can keep track of that order. Um, turn it back down when you're done talking. So I'm going to... Having said that, turn it over to Ian. Okay. Uh, good afternoon again. Uh, I am not DJ Patil. He uh, was the name on the agenda for this particular uh, portion of the discussion. Uh, but the deputy, see if I can get his title right, Deputy Chief Technology Officer and Chief Data, well, I can admit, Chief Data Scientist, Scientist for the, pre for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Ah, a, lot of, a lot of letters there. Uh, he was called away uh, uh, to support the Department of Defense for something. So let's hope he's there, uh, not on his way here. Uh, in his absence, uh, I will do my best to moderate uh, a discussion uh, that we will loosely call the North Star discussion. So um, for those at the, at the table here, we wanted to pose a few fun questions about the future of the data sector. And then the goal for this uh, brief exchange is just to get some of your feedback here in big group. Uh, about where you think the, again, the data sector, data economy will be going in the future. And then with that understanding, we basically hope, we the Department of Commerce and, and federal government, hope to evolve in the right way to support that future. So wh what's the future of data? So that, that's basically the core question. And I'll have a few questions underneath that uh, where we have some specific curiosities. Uh, but with that broad uh, brush stroke, I think I will open it up first to uh, the members at the table. Would anyone like to share their perspectives about where they think the data economy and the data sector will go in the next two, five, or ten years? <laughs> Who would like to start? Uh, Dan. Um, so I'll jump in here. Uh, I'm, I'm with the think tank, so we're supposed to be thinking about this. Um, so one thing that I think is really interesting, at least when we look at government, and then when we're looking at kind of trends in this space, is that Historically, government uh, agencies had to really deal with the problem, how do we just manage all this data? So a lot of the innovation was really around collecting and storing the data. And now, and what's really exciting is we were really innovating around data analytics. And so I think the trend that we're seeing in the next few years is really building these platforms for innovation and thinking about um, you know, how we're building, I mean, Socrata, Kevin, you're here. I mean, Socrata is a platform for innovation in the private sector. And so when we're looking at government, I think that's the same kind of model that we're trying to look at. How do we move from just saying open data and APIs, and APIs is moving in that direction, to really saying you know, all the data that we have, how are we creating the right kind of uh, technology platforms, process platforms, even kind of people platforms to allow this kind of innovation to occur? And so that's one of the kind of big themes that I'd like to see us explore. You know, I was at the gym this morning and I was working out and I was looking out the window of the hotel and there was a rack of red bikes, city bikes, across the street. You know, you can find city bikes in almost every city in the United States and around the world, very common. But who would have thought five years ago that governments, that municipal governments would be offering bicycles for rent? They would be, they're not selling bikes, but in a sense they are 
displacing private industry that sell bikes, aren't they? Because by providing bike rentals, they're making transportation possible for people who don't need to own a bike. And that's a different type of government service, isn't it? You would say, in a way, they're competing with the private sector. But no, they're thinking about how to provide a meaningful service to the public. I think we can think about data in the same way. How is government service going to change when we can collect more data? For example, why do we report business results on a quarterly basis? Why don't we have monthly, weekly basis reporting? What would that look like if the government collected data from business on a weekly or monthly basis? Those are questions that I think I'd like us to grapple with. How does government itself innovate from data collection from business and from the economy? Why do we always have to channel our efforts at quarterly focus and then revise our numbers later? Why don't we have accurate business statistics about the growth of the economy on a weekly basis? And what would that look like from a data point of view? Would we collect transactions from businesses directly? Why do we have to have, I mean, what is the regulatory burden for businesses to report financial results on a quarterly basis? And why doesn't government just collect the transactions and eliminate the reporting requirement and change the regulatory burden? Hmm. Uh, Stan, uh, or it looks like you wanted to respond? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, oh, no, to uh, push, yeah. uh, I was going to say that um, I guess I'm, I'm particularly interested in the various levels of government and how they're going to evolve over the next few years, where I think that if I look at the federal level, I think that in my opinion, I think two really seminal events for data policy at the federal level was one in the early 90s with the advent of kind of OMB's cost of reproduction, where before there were different parts of the federal government that possibly saw provision of raw data as, as being a profit center. And that converted the thinking into being, well, the taxpayers have already paid for the data, and now we'll, we won't lose money distributing it, but we're going to put it out there. We'll charge you for the CD-ROMs or the infrastructure to get it out there, but that's, that's it. We're not going to make money on it. I think that was really seminal. And then I think the more recent advents of things like data.gov and machine-readable formats and really taking that next step and saying, you know, any data that gets provided, we want it to be machine-readable, and we're going to set ourselves up for more of an API-oriented big data infrastructure. I think those are two really seminal periods for the federal government. And they... But all that development, I think, when you look at state and local, is a lot more nascent, where we still find in Zillow's business, um, you know, a lot of our data comes in from federal resources, things like census and weather data and other stuff. Um, but I would say the bulk of it comes in from state and local authorities. So things like public uh, tax assessing records and ta uh, you know, deeds and mortgages are all captured usually at the county or municipal level. And, and there, the landscape is much more, it looks more like the 1980s at the federal level, where you've got certain municipalities who think that's a cost center and they want to charge for that. Others take a cost of reproduction stance, and very few of them have any concept of wanting to put things out in machine readable formats and thinking about how do I, you know, if I'm going to create a system to, to do this internally, it's not that much extra money to make it to create a, a, a format that then makes accessible by anyone else, but yet they're just that thinking is um, uh, is not very widespread because they're trying to solve their problems in those jurisdictions right now, which are not how to open data up, but rather just how to get their own needs met. So we're really interested in how to foster some of the more forward thinking from the federal government down to lower levels so that they're all on that same page. And, and I think that will happen. Okay. Uh, I'm going to build on what um, Steve discussed here. As we look in the... Um, if I think back to the sort of private sector initially, we use data to customize our interactions to clients, right? And the more we customized it, we saw returns come from that. So it was a give to get. With the government doing it the right way, they can now customize to the exact type of people or businesses that we see. And with that give to get, it becomes a much more powerful synergy. Mm -hmm. You can actually deliver the government service that allows the person or the company to grow which in terms deliver more revenue or other social services, and that cycle begins to continue. Mm -hmm. And as you spin the cycle with better innovation platforms, it gets to be a much richer relationship. I think those are one of the things we want to explore as well. 
Uh, that's a powerful point. I, I want to come back to the gift to get, but I think I, I saw a comment uh, before then. Oh, did I miss one? Oh, uh, okay. Well, Dana, would you like to go uh, uh, next? Sorry. I'm going in a different direction. So if you're oh, uh, just the bill. I think it was uh, Stan was speaking uh, when you had a. Uh, oh, please, please go um, right ahead. Yeah. Uh, so let me put my science hat on oh. and talk a little bit from science perspective. A lot of what people were talking today, and I'll continue what Daniel said, but taking a little bit next level. There was a lot of talk today, what data is available, how we're collecting data, and how we make data available. It's great, but sounds like data warehousing. How do we make data warehousing available for the public? Which is very important, needed part, not even question ask. Then there was second part, oh, let's create analytics. We have those wonderful new websites which displayed in the graphical way instead of bar charts, which we did before, or whatever it is, wonderful new websites. That's the next level, very important. But really, with all the data we have today, it has to be taken to the next level. How do, what do we do with the data? How we can change the data in the real time, right? How we can use the data in the real time? And, you know, there was a great amount of data, uh, National Oceanic Administration, they have a lot of data, but they also have a lot of models. So how do people using the results, how do people using their prediction? You know, I can talk from business perspective, when we look at the business data, the, whatever reports are done and reported today, they are wonderful. We probably wanted to see them a little bit different. If the government would have a platform where we can go in, in and say, okay, this particular metrics, how you measure GDP, it's wonderful. But I want to remove this particular component here and add that here because that's how I want to see GDP because that's, it's not how government sees it, but that's me as a company wants to see it. And if their platform would be available, it would be wonderful for me to go and do it. On the other hand, on National uh, Oceanic Administration, I sell. So for me, I'm really interested in the buoy data. But I'm, I sell around San Francisco Bay Area. I'm just interested in those 50 buoys around it. And I'm interested in their models, but based on those buoys. How can, can I take their model and modify it a little bit and essentially have a push notification for me, which I deploy myself, which says, good time to go sailing, let's go. <laughs> uh, I'm not good enough to deploy those models. I don't know how to build models. But, you know, to take some model, modify it, probably could do it. Yeah. Now, if there would be a platform available, it would be, I think, very usable for people. It would be very usable for companies. It would be very usable for everyone. On clouds, on cloud side of the providers, there are some new cloud providers which start to provide machine learning as a part of the cloud providers, but it's still been out there. But how do we tie it together with data and make it available that it's all easily tied up? And then you will have a lot of small startups growing up in Silicon Valley and everywhere, and uh, you will see a large company using the data as well. It's an interesting point, and I want to uh, return to, to Dana's uh, contribution, but I do think that this is part of what the Secretary was teeing up when she said things like uh, raw wholesale information versus retail apps, more broadly speaking. And what, what's the right stage? What's the right lever of the uh, fuel of data being refined at different stages? And do we only have the entry point into that data stream at the end point, at the retail side, where here's the, here's the, uh, you know, the pie chart, whether you like it or not, and you can't get inside, or how much do we give the dirty information or the raw information, probably a better way of saying it, further upstream, even if it's not as understandable for as many people, right? And so I think th this is something we struggle with, and I think it's part of the reason the Secretary brought up that, that question. Uh, I, I will say that just from uh, a, a brief dispatch, there were various answers to that philosophy, various responses to that, depending on the product, on the bureau, on the organization, on the mission of that organization. Um, and so I, I do think that there's a lot of opportunity to, to dive into that deeper, but I, I, I do think it is part of something that we're already uh, questioning. And I, I really much appreciate the perspective, especially to be able to sail on the San Francisco Bay. I mean, that's a that's an inspiring use case right there. So yeah, uh, Dana. So <clears throat> there's a tremendous amount of data within uh, the Department of Commerce, but there's also a tremendous amount of knowledge what I've always been in awe of the different agencies within commerce is how much care they have for all of the data that they see. The realization that there are serious consequences when that data is dirty, when that interpretation is wrong, there are lives at stake, there are people whose voices aren't heard, and we've heard it even in, in this whole question about what does it mean to count everybody? What does it mean to count people who, who lack homes that aren't actually part of households as we would normally construct them? They're not part of the business world frame of who we think about how to count. I bring this up because one of the things that I struggle with as I think about your challenges versus the industry's challenges is, frankly, 
if if Chris's crowd gets you know an advertising advertisement wrong, it's just not that big of a deal. You know, it's kind of entertaining when they think I'm a trucker because of my patterns. When you when you get weather data wrong, it's a huge deal. Lives are at stake, money is deployed, people are, you know, I think about storm analysis. So part of what I'm, I'm thinking through is not just how you make the data available, but how you make the really hard thinking that goes into cleaning that data available. Because that process of cleaning is so critical, that process of analysis is so critical, and I worry that we get to a point where we think that the data speaks for itself, that we end up causing ourselves a huge problem down the line. No, that's an excellent point. Uh, Katie? I like the idea of an of a innovation accelerator. When we go from the data age to the innovation age, I think that's what we're really looking forward to. And I would like to remind you that many people out there never get to touch a terabyte of data. They also do have rather low information visualization literacy. We just did a study across um, several science museums here in the US, and it was very, very um, impressive um, in, in a negative sense to me. And I can provide more information on this. But ultimately, I believe what we want to do is to raise the information uh, literacy and data visualization literacy of everyone, not just a few companies, not just a few power users, but of everyone. And we have powerful infrastructures such as formal and informal science education. Actually, science uh, museums would be a great way to install a bike that doesn't get you from A to B, but that um, lets you explore data in new ways, and that would be a service. And of course, they could also be deployed in a library setting, and then people would get to see that they can do it. I actually truly believe that you have to make these visualizations visualizations in order to be able to interpret them and in order to be able to really understand what they mean. You have to go from the raw data to the um, final visualization. Just reading visualizations all day long will not get you there. And um, I think that then also calls for us to expose some of this expertise, which Dana related to, um, via, for instance, massively open online MOOCs, uh, which all the open education which we now can use to um, make open data and open code more, more valuable to many. Just pause here before uh, calling on the next person. It, it is rather fascinating already as I think about the breadth of how many topics are, are being brought up here. I know, so I have roles and responsibilities of government, uh, the coordination between the levels of government, feedback loops with customers, wholesale versus retail, quality versus quantity, the education, the educational res actually responsibilities. Uh, and obligations that we have to the consumers. Um, there, there was, uh, you know, perhaps some uh, veil of aspiration to be able to coordinate some of the topics here and uh, streamline them a bit, but I think uh, in, at a uh, humility, I will say that it, it really demonstrates the, the breadth. There are so many aspects of this problem that are worth addressing, and I'm gonna do my best to keep track of them and, and come back around to see how we can translate these, again, with that core uh, uh, ask from uh, Secretary Pritzker to how do we translate these problems all the way through to some recommendations, but I think this is still very helpful to really understand the breadth and depth of this problem that we are facing. Uh, so with that, again, editorial, I'm gonna go to Heather, who is there, there sorry. So just building a little bit on, on uh, the last few comments, I think one of the, the areas I'm most interested in is this idea of incentivizing uh, the behavior of sharing data, of open data and the behavior of um, doing the work to actually get the data in a format that people can work with in a meaningful way. And I think so often we have uh, circumstances and situations between the academy and the government and industry where those positions that, where you're annotating data, where you're cleaning data, where you're actually doing stuff to make data useful to other people isn't rewarded in any kind of visible way. And so I'd like to see us explore perhaps that theme of how we might um, dig into that a little bit. Okay, uh, Bill? Yeah, I'll follow up on this point about cleaning data. I think one of the interesting things we're, uh, one of the interesting transitions we're going through is from um, sort of clean sources to dirty sources. So clean source means we spend a lot of time trying to qualify the source, building a very expensive satellite or ground mm -hmm. system or whatever the case may be. Um, and in the future, that's going to be replaced at least to some extent by observations where you don't know the quality of the observations and you impose quality after the fact. And the implication of that is the amount of truly raw data is gonna grow by a huge amount. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, so, so again, sort of building on a couple of the comments, but, but going back to um, the 20 month time frame, trying to, um, if, if, if I really think about the data economy, if we were a movie, we'd be in the opening credits. And the next 20 months seems like the first um, chapter of the movie, we've got to identify the characters, the plot has to start to develop. And so when I think about that, there's, there's sort of three vectors of data, the commercial value of the data, um, the security of that data, and then the privacy associated with that data. And I'd like to see us address the tension points. Think of that as a triangle. There's a tension, there are three tension points at each one of those. Industry will innovate and um, drive the commercialization uh, layer with some framework around security and privacy of what they have to do, designing privacy in as an example. Um, but security and privacy themselves are a tension point. And so if we think about policy, I think we should try to think about um, spending some time on those tension points so that something could be built into sustainability into the department beyond the next 20 months. So that would be the first point. Then the, the sort of building on Daniel's point of the, um, uh, you know, the way we are, the use of data, the tools uh, data at the analytics level today are just sort of being developed and they're actually quite difficult. It's quite difficult to extract uh, data from the government. It's, it's difficult to um, build the machine learning algorithms and the models, et cetera. Um, and so what, there's a lot of verticalization, the platform starting to develop. And um, I, I think there's a delineation somewhere, if you think about it as a stack, um, defining up through what layer does the government provide open access to the data, uh, sort of as a public service, and then is there commercial value added services above that, and then the rest is left for industry to innovate on. So it would be useful, I think, to have some level of data architecture um, that could be standardized across these many vertical platforms that will develop over time. If I can just uh, ask a quick clarifying question uh, about this uh, data movie that we're all characters and directors and actors in. Um, so I, I have, a, I have a, I guess I hope that the next two years is more of a action movie than a tragedy movie or a documentary, I guess. It's a love story. It's a love story. It's, it's a, a love, love story. <laughs> it's actually, oh, it's literally, it's literally on my laptop. It's I love data. I, I so hope, it is a love story. But I hope it's not yeah. a mystery because then you have oh, know how it plays out, right? That's even worse. Right? We um, have to, it's got to be a. But and I, I think we'll get into the uh, the script for that, but <laughs> over the, for the 20-month version of that movie. But at a, just the, the, at a curiosity, you talked about these tension points. On the long term, and as much as we can have long term in anything technology, wh what are the long term tension points that you think are absolutely critical to this to this future? Um, so, so I, I think the um, you know I'll say the commercial application. So, if you think about the data economy, what you're doing is you're building an economy that's based on a set of services that are using data analytics to deliver that service, and um, uh, the risk if it's not built in a secure manner, if it's not built with privacy in mind, is that we end up corrupting the broader economy. Um, and, and you see that happening with identity theft today. Um, you see the tremendous burden on credit card companies happening for th through fraud. Um, because it happened so fast, and we weren't able to address it, we have the opportunity to sort of get ahead of some of this as this economy develops. And I think without forethought, um, we'll consta constantly be paying catch up and I don't think that's sustainable um, when you think about are we here to, to help you know businesses become more competitive and help the US economy become more competitive you have to think about these things as designed in um, Chris yes so one of the things that was really pretty remarkable about the ignites was the ITA discussion where they, they stood up a API for export control I've worked on export control for better part of 15 years uh, for, for cryptography products. Um, and it shows uh, a really interesting thing. I mean, that uh, a government agency, uh, actually uh, uh, a bureau within the department, right? They, they, they said, okay, well, what we need to do to better serve our customers, to better serve the citizens of the United States, is to make sure that they have accurate, timely information, right? So they, they stood up this API, which is a very rare thing in the government. and um, 
and they did that, and that's very interesting. And you could say, well, you know, it's not a big data set, but whatever. But th what, what they did that's remarkable is they, 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 they said, okay, what's our mission? What serves our mission? Let's launch this, and they launched it. So uh, it would seem to me that, that the Commerce Department would say, okay, well, that's really interesting. So go to them, say, okay, what did you do? How did you do it? And can we replicate it across the other bureaus? And then maybe throughout the department, and then pass that over to the other parts of the executive branch and then to the other parts of the government, right? So, so basically, you know, basically run by example, right? Um, and I, I thought that was um, a really powerful story, even though I, I know logically it's not the biggest data set in the world. We have about 193 countries, and yeah. we really care about five, yeah. maybe six yeah. of them, you know, uh, <laughs> depending on the week, you know, and, um, you know, uh, Cuba, we're not sure about. And, um, but yeah, so, um, so, so I just wanted to like stress how neat that was, right? Because on the other side, we have NOAA, and we're, okay, so NOAA has these intensely amazing data sets that are incredibly vast and changing and growing every day, right? And so, um, you know, NOAA has approached the problem by having co-location, for instance, with, with, with Esri and, and opening up pipes into the, in the various cloud providers to provide that data in a timely fashion. And, and, and so they have the raw data problem that, that ITA probably doesn't have, where they're like, well, how do we get this data out and, and in, a, in, a, in a clever and fast and you know, incredibly retail in terms of large mm -hmm. way. Um, and, and I just think that we should, we should be able to learn from them too, because um, if we get too wrapped up in just seeing the outputs of the models or the outputs of some processing system, um, you could end up um, failing. Yep. For, for lack of a better word. Uh, you saw this in some of the uh, requirements from NIH and some of the other departments to, uh, they're like, okay, well, we're funding your research. We need to see the, 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 the outputs of that research be released under open you know, standards and licenses and all the rest, right? Um, but for a lot of researchers, that meant, well, here's the paper I was gonna give to the journal, so we're gonna release this, what, a year later, and all the outputs are there, have fun with that. But you can't replicate that mm -hmm. because you don't have any of the primary sources from the cell data or from, from the study. So, so having a really good look at defaulting your outputs to open uh -huh. with obvious respect towards privacy issues um, should be something that you stress. Right. So, anyway. well, well, no, I appreciate those comments, and if it's okay, I'd like to uh, clarify again and challenge just a little bit what yeah. that means in the short term versus the long term. So, um, scale and, and, and the ability to replicate. So, let's say as a hypothetical, um, there's a big push to API all open, or open by default, or a API by default. Right. But let's say, I don't know, let's just have some fun with a what if game. You know, five, ten years from now, whenever you save a file, whatever software you're using, open source or proprietary, there is a default to API feature in every I'm just going to arbitrarily say a Word document, a HTML page, a you know a shared drive. Like, is that going to happen anyway? To the point where why should the Commerce Department spend three years just trying to API anything if oh by the way five years from now it's not even going to be it's going to be commoditized? You know, for example, like the, you see what I'm going with this. Like yeah. in, in the in the long term, if we were trying to you know steer an aircraft carrier, it doesn't doesn't turn very quickly. Do we want? Are we going to tack too soon? and try to respond to the idea of the moment and miss the long-term goal sure. as it relates to scalability and replication? Well, I mean, I, I would only say, let yourself make the mistake, right? So, I mean, one of the big problems in the government is, is, is and I was a civil servant like 25 years ago, <laughs> and I'm sure it's changed, right, totally, um, <laughs> is that people sometimes feel uh, that if they were to make a mistake, in, and not in releasing classified information or anything really serious like that, but just if their projects aren't seemed to be successful, right, um, for a given organization to find that however you will, that, you know, they're no longer listened to, they're shunted off to Siberia or, you know, North Dakota or wherever you put people, and, and, and that's it, and they're never given a chance again. So if you say, well, listen, we're just gonna open up as much as we can, as conveniently as we can, as soon as we can, um, and, you know, uh, if we release the wrong things, I mean, data.gov is filled with files that nobody's ever touched. <laughs> um, and there's been very little growth, uh, productive growth there. Um, and, and so a lot of the people who worked on data.gov, I know for a fact, they're like, well, we don't like it when people say that. We don't like it when people say that we, f we failed to do something there. It's like, and, and actually it was a remarkable success in that they got stuff out there as fast as they did, uh, as, as, as frankly, as comprehensively as they did in a short amount of time. The problem was they stopped there, right? 
they, they continued to do a lot of that same thing. Because they're, they're like, okay, we've defined success as this. Um, and they didn't say, well, are people actually using this? Are they actually shipping this stuff out? And, and, and that was sort of the tragedy. And it's like, and we can address that tragedy and say, well, you know, let's, let's skip this whole PDFification of things. And, and, and that was exactly like you described. It was, you know, the world pivoted away from PDFs because they were hard to use, you know? And so we would rather get primary sources and CSVs and all the rest, right? So anyway. Hit your button, hit your button. Oh, sorry, okay. When you say they stopped there, what, what do you mean? Like, what should they have done? They should have gone into um, they should have plum plumbing on applications? Um, so I, I would have loved if they had standardized uh, not just getting documentation from a given department, putting it on day.gov and releasing it, to creating the whole feed so when a given organization creates something, that spreadsheet, say, from, uh, from one of the department's bureaus would, would go from the department to, you know, data.gov, uh, on a whole continuum, con uh, constantly. And, and some people, I think, must have done this, right? But, th but that is part of what, I mean, wasn't it that they had a bunch of legacy stuff they wanted to at least digitize and get up there, right. but, but then they had a bunch of was, projects was a good deal, to create the right? pipeline as well, but a bunch of stuff didn't have pipelines, but at least it's digitized and accessible right. now. So, so, exactly. So it was an obvious, wonderful success to get the archives up, right? right? But, yeah. It was all the easiest and stuff. It was all the yeah. easy stuff first. Well, well, that's where you start, right? Yeah. 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 So. But, if I can just pause for one moment on this, um, That's right. I, the, the data.gov process uh, and opportunities, I think, continue. Um, I also think that there's a fair opportunity to look backwards at what did and did not go well with that one ongoing project. Uh, and so while I try to keep this conversation, if I may, a little bit more focused on the future of what the sector will be with or without data.gov, with or without the Department of Commerce. Where's the business, where are you, where are you all going to be 10 years from now? Right. And I'd like to keep that North Star vision for a bit so that I think, if, if I may propose, it will be easier for us to better understand what happened in the past if we have a better vision of the future. Uh, I'm also going to call a bit of an audible. I know that Steve, Daniel, and Colin all had their uh, cards up first, but there's a couple of folks who have not had a chance to contribute yet. So if it's okay, that's, that's I'd like to uh, turn the table over to Joy. Um, sure. Um, I think I want to build on a few of the last few comments, which um, – so I, I think the North Star question is hard. I feel like we just, we, we tend to be crappy at predicting the future. So given that, um, I think one of the roles of this council could be um, how to make the Department of Commerce <coughs> and the lessons from that not only sustainable per what Kim said, but the flexibility to respond to how things will shift. And I think it's not just the technical flexibility and the need for platforms, which I think during the Ignite talks, I think we heard about three separate new platforms being developed, mm -hmm. um, but also the culture that can maybe be in the things that can be put in place over the next 20 months so that when the administration shifts, which this is this, every government has this problem, um, what's the culture to put in place and the organizational people and processes to allow that to be a virtuous, responsive cycle? Absolutely. Uh, the, the culture question, I think, is an uh, essential one to this entire conversation. Uh, Brian. Great. So um, one of the, the things that you know, we've, we've kind of seen is that at the end of the day, somebody has to do something differently with data. Right? At the end of the day, you're, um, you're not just analyzing to find some interesting insight or something like that. You're going to make some decision differently, do operations differently, something like that. For, I think, most of the commercial applications, you're almost always going to need to combine the information with something private, something that doesn't exist out in public, anything like that, to actually make this useful, to actually you know, have some real value to the analysis you're doing, the modeling you're doing, anything like that. Um, there's a lot of like pure public useful applications, but I think most of most businesses in the world are going to want to combine it with private information. Um, so I think you know, kind of along the ideas of getting out the raw information, getting out all that, I think that becomes a, a critical thing to drive like real adoption in the business community is they have to be able to actually get access to the information, combine it with their with their private data. The other interesting aspect of this though is to actually combine it with something like customer data, anything like that. You really start to stress the privacy pieces here, right? So like how granular, how accurate um, do you actually make that publicly available data? And I think that's going to be a real challenge. And I think you know there's there's a lot of not obvious answers there, but there's a lot of interesting kind of policy frameworks people have tried with HIPAA and a lot of other things for how you can disclose this, what is reasonable, that I think will be a very interesting question over the next couple of years. 
Uh, absolutely, and I'll also confess from a, a previous life, I was one of the businesses that combined public data with private data, so I, I completely empathize with, and agree with that comment. Uh, Jack, would you like to speak next? I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to say, because <laughs> you keep... <laughs> First, I think it's useful to distinguish between data and apps, and the revolution today is not the data revolution, it's the app revolution, and we see it on all these devices. And apps need data. I mean, making this distinction is really powerful. Zillow is a fantastic app, right? And it wasn't, was it facilitated by open data? Or was it facilitated by somebody thinking through, this is a cool app that every citizen wants to have, and then I'll go around and hunt for data, public and private, and put it together? I suspect the latter, although I'm not sure. Or maybe. The distinction. So, so a lot of the data was publicly available before, right. but squirreled away in some industry database or some county file. So it was technically public, but not easily accessible. So the effort was to make it easily accessible. Right. So would you have uh, built Zillow um, faster if the data was more publicly available? Yes. Really? Yeah. Okay. So, so I mean, I mean, if, if data were, um, you know, if it was really easy for I mean, think about a lot of the counties we're from. So King County, Washington, or LA sure. are places where it's pretty easy to actually get property transactions shown on a map now. But you, the other 3,000 counties is, you know, was, is very hard today, much less in 2005. It was impossible. So Zillow has an information product that it provides as a web service. It's right. just fantastic. It, it's really interesting, too, Thank because a, a, Esri manages so many of the plat maps for so many of the counties, and then the counties have to open up those interfaces to the outside right. world as opposed to just dumping out files uh, like PDFs and, and or just printing out the old plat maps. Um, and so in some ways, if you guys could work together, <laughs> you would be in, in, in a really good place. If, you, if we could convince counties that it was important to publish that data in a machine-readable way out of, out of Esri's good work, you know. So. What I'm getting at is that right. data.gov has lots of open data. Is that the thing that's stimulating apps or is it the ingenuity of people like Zillow that create these apps? I mean, I have a bunch of Zillow-like apps, but they're not, they're a different domain. They're for, um, you know, commercial and community assessments. You've used some of them, Mark. And uh, we built those over a period of years at great cost, and we scoured around to get the data to feed it. It wasn't that the data was available there. It was, uh, we, we found the data. So what I keep, being interested in is how do we stimulate people to hunt for the inf to create the information products that are needed and wanted and then go after the data i mean i've never had trouble getting data out of government to build the apps that i built i mean it was hard like you were saying harder than it maybe should be but the inspiration for building the apps was not the fact that there was open data and the, so the ecosystem is really about getting people to think about data-driven apps, and then, and then yes, facilitate. So in the promotion of the open data, what I'm getting at is we need to promote people thinking and being creative like Zillow and, and hundreds of, actually there's not hundreds of other apps like Zillow. There's only a handful uh, that are built out of government data sets. I do think this is one of those orthogonal shifts though. I think you're very right about what history says, how um, information services have um, arrived to the marketplace. Um, what we're seeing, though, with the sheer volume and velocity of data, because the data's there, new creative ideas and innovations are coming because the data is available. Yeah, maybe there's a, there's a co-evolution right, of right. this so, thought, so, no question. So an Push example would be um, retail stores have collected video data for theft reasons for decades. But as video analytics come, become available and great visualization technology becomes available, right now they use vid that theft, what was captured for theft prevention reasons, they now use that to determine um, what goes on special, what goes at the point of sale, uh, those impulse purchases. They can tell by who's in the parking lot what they need to put at the front of the store display to drive greater transaction volume in the store. I, I think that that's fundamental to the open data movement. Right. Is that almost, so, I, I almost never find a government data set that was designed for universal use. 
the census might be one of the few exceptions, but generally they're waters for water management or this yeah. for this or that for that. It's really opening it up and making it available yeah. in some way that's more generic. Yeah. More, more than 30% of the U.S. economy is driven by weather. And, um, and people use the farmer's almanac to de determine that. And that's why charcoal on sunny days goes in the front of the grocery store. And it's why um, you know, people pick a train route versus a trucking route for um, supply chain delivery. Um, with advanced analytics, right, when that data becomes available, you get the tremendous amount of operational improvement um, in business if you can use the data. And no one's using that data in that way yet. So, so and I, I, if I can just, uh, and I'll say this, I will say to, to combine both points, I think that there is a natural and attractive value to information like census data and weather data, and I'll just throw GPS data in there as well. Mm -hmm. These are the, I think, the ones that make perfect sense for multiple applications uh, uh, de uh, being deployed in different products over time. There's a timeliness factor. There's also some characteristics of quality data in terms of uh, real time, it's uh, uh, coverage, uh, uh, accessibility that allow data sets loosely categorized mm -hmm. like that to provide that type of uh, infrastructure for businesses. But I think, and Jack, to your point, there's a long tail that don't necessarily fit the same mold. And there's a question, I think it's a fair question, I'll call it a theme, about push versus pull. Are we just trying to push data out there and hope someone can transform megabytes into dollars or jobs? Or is there more of a, someone's trying to build a company and they're trying to get that data? And I think that's a, that's a very fair question and probably one that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna exist for a long time. Yeah, uh, the, th I, oh, the, the yes. thing I wanna really hit on here is the value chain of data starts with the raw data. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not. And those data sets that are gonna be more generally valuable ought to be assessed in terms of prioritizing making the data available. GPS is a classic example. Second, to make an app really sing, getting the data ready, you call it cleansing it or doing the processing, is really an important thing. In the private sector, often that has been a, a opportunity for people to take the old raw dime files or tiger files and process them into GIS ready applications. Um, but I think somebody spoke, I think it was you spoke about the issue of, are you talking about really the federal government getting in the app business? No, um, I think it is moving up that value chain of getting it more application ready. So if apps are the vision, if apps where the creativity is, we could really radically improve the ability for a startup or a mature company to take that data and make it useful if it's not simply raw data in a bad format, but serverized through rich APIs that are open and interoperable, that could be integrated data set to data set. All of that is an opportunity. Is that gonna be the private sector will take the raw data and we will serverize it? Or um, should it be that uh, there's a new way of REST services that allow developers to build on a platform and be innovative and concentrate there? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Oh, yeah, and, and, and Karen, I definitely want to come back to you. I'm sorry we, uh, to uh, not turn the mic over just yet, but this is a, it's a fascinating point, and uh, it's the, the example you gave about the, say, dime files, the shape files, is leading me to think that there may be a, a general uh, theme here that uh, the types of questions and problems facing the data economy today, it sounds like what you're all maybe saying is that they'll probably continue into the, into the long-term future just the way we answer them may evolve. The file format, the accessibility levels may change, but accessibility is probably gonna be a big deal even five years from now. That, that's, I'll just say, I'll share that as one emerging thesis based on what I'm hearing so far. But I, I, do, I do think that as well that push versus pull will probably also be one of those perennial issues uh, about the role of government in that, in that ecosystem. Should we, uh, since there is a probably natural capability for uh, data generation in the government as a, we'll say, a competitive advantage. Uh, does that mean that we will probably continually have to decide uh, our fit? So uh, Somebody's gotta be smart about prioritizing where you spend your money that you make available yeah. data sets. Yeah. And, and without that, I mean, you see it with data.gov, 130,000 data sets. I would dare say that only a few dozen of them are ever used. And uh, that's not a criticism, to, it's just, there's an edict, so let's, okay, let's spend a lot of money on getting all the government's data out there, whether it's useful or not. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. 
Uh, Karen. Yeah, so I, I'm feeling a little bit like Jack be, when he said, I'm not exactly sure what to say because well, I was waiting for my turn, like the conversation turns around. But um, I, I really like something that Jack just said a few minutes ago about the value chain and, and that one of the considerations that we face a lot as a company is dealing with that value chain, understanding whether the data is actually any good to start with. And I remember that also. Um, from my days in genomic science and knowing that in the last decade with next gen technology, a whole lot of the data that has gone into the federal repositories is probably not worth much yet, but it's hard, it's not labeled as being not worth much. So it looks to everybody like it's just as golden as the stuff that was, you know, sequenced diligently and, and, and proofread and curated very well. So I think that that's a real, a real issue is that that consumers generally would need to face. We as experts in science or something could go through and figure out what's, you know, what makes sense and what to throw away. But just the general, you know, like a general user wouldn't be able to do that. So I think that's an important part. I also wanted to echo Kati's um, comments about visualization because I don't think we talk about that very much. Um, I think it's something that's been, people are so used to seeing a static viz, like, a, like you know, a pie chart or a thing. And I think that our, our next generation coming up, they want to be able to poke and play at the data and think of their own new ways to look at it, not just see, you know, here's the canned chart that the developer put up on the website today. Um, or here's the Excel sheet and I've got to manipulate, you know, a, a table with Excel. A uh, brief uh, question. Did I mispronounce your name? Is it Kati? I apologize for mispronouncing it earlier. Uh, Alan, do you want to contribute? Oh, so I, um, one of the things which I've heard, at least I've heard uh, in a lot of these comments, um, has been, we, because we've covered a lot of ground here, is about um, sort of two, sort of what are we trying to achieve? Um, it would be really useful, I mean, for me anyway, to get a clear idea. Data aside, data is only one way to do things. What's the thing that we're actually trying to do? Because it might help focus the conversation or at least help focus the, uh, the kind of comments about what we think the future actually looks like. Sure, that, and that's a great point. I mean, the truth is that uh, there are a lot of things we're trying to accomplish, frankly, and that's, uh -huh. part, of, that's part of the challenge. Uh, the Secretary made uh, the comment about how our, as a department, when mm -hmm. I say our, I mean the Department of Commerce, our goals extend from the surface of the sun to the deepest depths of the ocean, literally. Those are some of the objectives within the organizations, uh, just the bureaus of the, the Department of Commerce, let alone the, the wider federal government. If I was to synth synthesize all of the objectives together, we happen to do that, and we, we uh, the department has said that it is to uh, strengthen uh, America's uh, economic prosperity, our, the job growth domestically, and competitiveness abroad. But, unfortunately, that can mean a lot of things. And so uh, this is, I think, part of the challenge. I think the very first comment that, that Steve made about scope, what exactly should our scope be? And if the data economy can mean so many things in the future, what role and obligations then, I think to Joy's point, can we pull back in that difficulty of predicting the future? Now, Alan, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it is an honest one. Well, it's, I mean, it's super useful because I mean, just even a little bit of focus helps a lot. And it prompts a lot of interesting questions. So. Um, uh, and, and by the way, I don't know if, if Mark or Lynn want to contribute to that. Yeah, if I could answer just a little bit. So Secretary Pritzker said what would be useful is if you gave us a list of, say, five or ten things that you think we should be focusing on. So at the reception tonight, when you're talking to her, she's going to ask you, what's your top five things? So if you want to, she told us that. That's good so, to know. <laughs> so you should start thinking about that. But, um, you know, with such a diverse body, that would be very, very useful for us because, as Ian said, you know, we just have so many things that we have to be working on you know, from your perspective, your backgrounds, your expertise, what do you think our priority should be? And that's what we're trying to flush out a little bit in this conversation today. Yeah, I would just add, um, also thinking about our role as government, uh, we have certain overarching mission areas where we could significantly use help. So we're thinking about when Ian talks about how do we use our data to create more jobs, like there are certain obligations that we have as federal government that we're trying to help the American people. So how do we improve economic opportunity? How do we help people make better decisions about where it is that they can live and thrive? How do we people help people understand how to access education and training that will get them up the economic ladder? I mean, the great thing about the breadth and depth of commerce data is we actually have data that touches on all of those issues. I think there are kind of 
data collection and curation and release questions that we have that are, are really, really important. And I think that the conversation that we just had touches on that, but also how do we as a government use our own data and partner with you to actually deliver better government services. And this is one of the reasons that we're so excited to have Joy here with us. Um, how do we touch people where they live in their communities with information? Our data represents tremendously valuable information and our goal as a federal government is a little bit different than your goal as business leaders. Um, we want to touch everybody. So we want, you know, the market may not be responding to folks that are at the lowest levels of the income ladder. Um, so how do we, how are we more effective as a federal government in delivering government services to the people who need it the most? And building on that, let me offer a perhaps unifying question, a, a, a way to reframe this. I know, uh, CJ, you haven't had a chance to, to contribute yet, but maybe I'll, I'll turn it to you as the first one to answer this question. There's a few uh, tools and mechanisms of the federal government that have a way of unifying people. Um, one of the phrases that we say inside government is a moonshot. So in the spirit of the way uh, JFK uh, said, by the end of the decade, we'll be walking on the surface of the moon, but there was no infrastructure to do any of that. There have been other, we'll call them challenges or competitions within the government to try to unify along a common theme. Uh, I come from the energy sector and I was familiar with one that was called Sunshot, basically to get solar photovoltaics below $1 per megawatt of retail price. At the time, solar was costing at best $3.50 per megawatt installed on your, on your roof, so to speak. Uh, and so getting that product, which is not a government product, but what can the government do to help the private sector in that collaboration get solar panels down below a dollar? That was a, we call it a moonshot type of challenge. And so I think about that as a futuristic type of question, but around the topic of data, what's a data moonshot? What's something that you all can challenge us or that we should challenge you on in terms of how we can help to evolve the sector? So I did say I was gonna, I don't know, uh, Akati, a, CJ, I uh, see uh, Steve, if you, Akati, maybe I think you were the first one to, to raise, the, raise the card, do you wanna speak first? That was a clever trick, I like that. I will use that again. <laughs> So my moonshot would be to empower anyone to at least read basic data visualizations because if they can make and read them, then they will automatically get interested to make and create more of these things. Um, and that's a huge challenge. So that has to do with the delivery of how these things are uh, used in newspapers, in um, government reports and the school system and libraries and museums, et cetera. Um, but I think there could be quite a bit of impact from, from um, uh, regulations. Um, the other part I wanted to share with you is that people typically want to see themselves in the data. They want to see their favorite sailing bay. They want to see their bicycle in front of the um, fitness studio. And um, experts do it because they want to see how clean the data is. And if, if the, the data doesn't have all their publications, they're not going to trust it. And um, children would do it because it's interesting to them. They want to see themselves and their friends and their family, et cetera. So um, by making it possible to have anyone see themselves in uh, the commerce data, um, that would be a key uh, enabler. Also, if you want to be a, a true um, innovation accelerator, um, I hope you do not only want to innovate in economics, but also in the arts and humanities and many other areas which we haven't even talked about, including health also. Okay, so I heard uh, everyone can read business data visualizations and everyone should be able to see themselves in commerce data. Those are clear challenges, I, I proposed challenges. Okay, there's a few folks that have been waiting a while. I think Steve was the first on the list. Thanks, I, I think I want to join Dana in uh, some comments on this. Uh, I remember a story, uh, it was a Google story actually, from 2010 in which um, Nicaragua invaded Costa Rica. Do you know the story? The wrong map? Yeah, the wrong yeah. map. Uh, in which they, do you know the story? Um, there was a little island on the border between Costa Rica and Nicaragua. Costa Rica doesn't have an army, they only have a police force. And uh, Nicaragua looked at the map, Google map, and it showed this island, which was part of Costa Rican territory, was actually on the map, part of Nicaragua. And the Nicaraguan said, oh, we didn't know that. It's on Google Maps, the authoritative source. And so they invaded the island, and the, and the Costa Rican said, hello, what are you doing? They said, well, it's on Google Maps, it must be right. Your map must be wrong. So they had to go to the UN, and they had to figure it out, and two years later, the, the Nicaraguans left. And the, the reason I bring up the point is, um, you know, data can uh, look really good, be really well presented, and come from an authoritative source and still be wrong. And the challenge that I have, I, I'm just so fascinated by the diversity but also the similarity of some of the businesses we have here together. I think it's, you guys did a great job putting us all together. 
just so many brilliant people from so many different companies. Guys, what is our responsibility to provide corroborative sources to government data? Now, I, I don't want to put a, a, a cast a shadow on government data, but, but you know, we have this tendency in the data world to focus on authoritative single sources of information. And that is a tremendous amount of power as we all become increasingly data driven. So what is the responsibility of industry to provide corroborative sources to data? And more, what is our responsibility to help decode the analytical algorithms that are used to create information products so that they can be audited? And that, I think that's a challenge for us in industry. I don't think government can do that. I think that's something we have to figure out how to do together. Uh, thank you for saying that. Uh, Daniel. Oh, yes. Up there longer than me. Oh, though. is that? I'm, fo true? I'm following the the dictatorship of the oh, okay. uh, pad of paper over here. I'm not quite sure. Really, it's <laughs> no, not. You don't have to be that formal. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, let me just make a couple of points. Um, I, you know, so one to Jack's point, I think I, I very much agree with that. And, and thinking about, you know, how I see these trends, I, I think we are living in kind of a, a new age of a, abundance of data and abundance of technology. And that doesn't mean we don't have a lot of improvement to go in those areas. But I think right now, one of our biggest weaknesses to, to the question about the moonshot is, is around people and education. And so figuring out how we really address that will be a, a huge problem, I think, just for the economy overall, but also especially for government and government agencies, because they have to compete for these data scientists and these data literate people um, more so than anyone else. And there's going to be a strong pool from industry uh, to recruit and retain. So government will have to figure out how they do that as well. Um, to the, the points that were made, uh, I think, Kim, you talked about sustainability, and Joy, you talked about culture and this kind of transition. And, you know, that, uh, you know, there will be, I think, a, a real question about how do we actually, um, you know, make this last. I mean, we are in Washington. Um, you know, we've, uh, I, I was watching some of the old uh, campaign debates, uh, presidential debates, and, you know, Department of Commerce was one of the, uh, you know, uh, departments that um, a particular candidate from my home state of Texas wanted to close down. And, um, you know, obviously this day is important. We want to see this continue. And so, you know, thinking about that, one of the big challenges is how do we show ROI on data efforts, not just open data specifically, but any data effort that we have. How do we really get that ROI? When you look at, you know, some of this is branding. When you look at, you know, the Super Bowl and you see, you know, uh, Super Bowl halftime show brought to you by Pepsi or Coca-Cola, you know, you know that somebody, you know, paid and made sure that, you know, their contribution was really visible. How do we make sure that these contributions that data make from government are really visible and valued so that we do have the political support uh, to do that? Um, last moonshot item on here I have um, is, is really just the idea of a smart city. I think this really ties into, um, you know, what we want to see coming out of data when we think about kind of the future, especially five to ten years out. Will the United States have a model smart city pilot going where we'll be able to figure out how's the best way that we can work with the government and the private sector to pull out this data to answer the questions that we have? Um, so I, I think that's everything that's been a while since this is up. Um, last, last minor little point, I just want anyone that's not around the table, I think we are all watching the Twitter feed, so if you have ideas, um, please make sure you're sharing them there because we are following that. Thank you for uh, echoing the, the Twitter hashtag, and I've also been watching them on uh, the laptop here and, and trying to bring them in as well, but thank you for echoing that. Uh, Colin. Um, you know, so I, I think about the discussion we've been having here. Part of what I'm trying to sort of figure out is how we take this forward, right? So if I, if I step back and I think about what at least one year it made our country great is that we looked at, we had an infrastructure, and the infrastructure had pieces that made sense. So you had the roads, you had the electricity, you had the education. Then you got the laws in, and then you got the capital structure. And from that, you know, to what Jack speaks about, the people who had the creativity burst out. What's the analogy if we look from that era, which was 50 years ago, to this era now? What are the equivalent roads? What are the equivalent infrastructure pieces? We talked about education, clearly a piece, right? What's the roads that we have to look at? Are the pipes right here? You know, if we begin to look at those things and then you're tired of moonshot that has the pattern to it in which you get other people engaged because that's a Twitter feed discussion, then I think we have a chance of building something here that has longevity because it, it excites other people to come in and it shows where everybody fits. I think we've got to think about that at some form or fashion, right? 
because every piece of every one of us talks about a different piece of the problem, and it's all correct. But I don't know if it'll make something happen unless we get that framework right in the moonshot right. Uh, Bill. Yeah, one of the um, interesting challenges you're going to have with an open data platform that um, is maybe a little under-recognized is that um, the, um, you're not going to have relationships with the end users and probably even the intermediate users. And so your ability to understand who's doing what with your data and when and how is, is going to be pretty poor. And it's different from what all of us in the commercial mm -hmm. community face. And, mm -hmm. and that's going to be a long-term challenge. And I don't know how to overcome it. Uh, maybe the moonshot is just understand our customers. That, that may be hard enough. Um, uh, CJ. I think from um, what we've been talking about today, that commerce has taken the first steps towards uh, your, your moonshot. And that is uh, the, the NOAA pro big data project is a perfect example of getting the data to some place that it can be used by the ecosystem and then out to all the more general users uh, across, you know, across the United States and the world. Um, so from the moonshot shot question, I think you're, you have that roadmap, or at least the beginnings of that, the first step of that roadmap um, that uh, Colin was speaking of earlier. Um, one of the areas that, that I'm a little bit torn on, and it goes back to the tension you spoke of earlier, and that is the, uh, the tension between uh, being transparent and then providing the value that in two of the three things that you, you said earlier, um, were U.S. centric and our market centric. How do you make the data transparent to all those in the ecosystem, preferably the U.S. ecosystem, without making it available to everyone else at the same time? That is going to be a challenge that I think we're going to have to address and potentially one of the things that we'll have to address here as part of, part of this uh, committee. Dana. One of the things that was laid out early on was that the goal is to, of the Commerce Department is to create the competitive, competitiveness of American business. And so I was thinking about what are the, some of the barriers that are really getting in the way of that. And I think it, heavily about the two intertwined dynamics of the growing levels of inequality in this country and the lack of technical capabilities in a technically driven uh, economy. And so I think about then what is the role of data? And what does data do? And when data is incorporated into a lot of business practices, what it does is maximize efficiencies, right? You're really trying to make systems more efficient. But the thing about growing levels of inequality is that they, in some ways, addressing those go at odds with this question of efficiency. And so what I keep thinking, if I'm thinking of a moonshot, is what are the right incentives and structures where you put data out there and, you know, gosh knows you have a lot of the data at least analyzes where we're at. But what are the kinds of data that you put out there that incentivizes trying to address the issues of inequality, the in, uh, issues of technical literacies with the information that's currently underway? And how do you make that incentivize within the broader commercial sector? Because I would argue that right now as our commercial sector is structured, that is not the incentive at all. And I worry that when we think about putting out data and making that more available, the incentive is to think about puzzles that help the privileged because they're the ones with the technical capabilities and they're the ones who are running the businesses that are capable of actually leveraging that. And so how much do I, I worry that it will just increase that inequality rather than work to address it? So with, with an eye on the calendar, thank you for saying that. Uh, clearly there's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot more discussion here. I'm, so I'm why I'm so glad that we have at least teed up some of the key problems. I, I do think that the moonshot question is one that is probably the right one to anchor on as we think about the next steps and as we go into the rest of the uh, agenda. Now, uh, Joy, Kevin, Jack, and Bill have all indicated that they want to speak, but with only about five minutes left, I will challenge those that are left to uh, maybe propose or synthesize uh, some additional moonshots, another way of phrasing it, I'll, I'll, I'll tee up the ones I've heard so far. Everyone should be able to read basic div uh, data visualizations as a data education, uh, to see themselves in Department of Com uh, Commerce data, uh, have, uh, to, this is Steve's point, be able to have a private sector corrobor corroborative validation of data, decode all information products, calculate a return on investment on data, smart city, these are all great things, but I think to Colin's point, which is the pipe and which is the moonshot? Um, and so I, I will uh, present that question to those that uh, rem are on the, on the list here before we go to the break. So, Joy. Um, sure, I would like to characterize mine as a near-orbit satellite shot. Um, 
and I, I sort of building on um, Dana's point uh, in taking my local perspective, and that is to have some kind of unified privacy framework from government. Because we have essentially watched all of our privacy frameworks around data grow up around distinct verticals and trying to navigate that at the local level in terms of the service provision to our most vulnerable populations is a nightmare. So, and then the streams of federal funding and how they affect our ability to leverage our data effectively, huge problem. And so I would, I would call out, I think that could be, I think that's achievable. I know there's lots of interest around that, but um, it's, it's really not working. And then how that leads to the commercialization of data is it makes it very hard for us to combine data sets across these sectors that are generating them, de-identify them appropriately, and then make them available. So I think this has, um, there's stakeholder interest, not at, only at the private level, but for our, our most vulnerable citizens as well. Uh, Kevin. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to offer what I think the future looks like and what the moonshot is needed to get there mm -hmm. and then give oh, okay. one current day example that uh, will we'll kind of uh, provide an anecdote. So the, the future in my, in my mind is a day when everybody can, can uh, interact with society and all of the small and big decisions that impact their daily lives that, do, that depend on government data have that data where it's most useful to them. Uh, the, the moonshot to get there is a commitment by the organizations that capture and create that data to put that data online in as raw a form in as real time as possible. Uh, and the, you know, the, the example that I would give of that we're, you know, we're closer to that reality than we think, and you know, I think the best way to predict the future is to extrapolate the current and then factor in cost savings around you know, cheaper compute, cheaper bandwidth, cheaper storage, those kinds of things. And you, you look at, um, you know, here at the table, you look at Zillow as an example where um, you, know, you think about uh, you know, a really important decision that people make on a, on a you know, not so recurring basis, you know, where do I buy a home? Uh, certainly we care about how much does the home cost, but you also care about uh, how safe is the neighborhood and how good are the schools and how close am I to public transportation and the source of all of that is government data. And so, you know, Zillow's doing a great job of, of pulling together all that government data and making it useful without, you know, special training, without, a, without even an understanding of data visualization techniques. And you know, I would even argue that every single person who does a home search on Zillow is actually consuming terabytes of data when they do so, and they just don't know that they're doing it. Uh, I, I will confess, uh, uh, being a, a data geek, I have a way of being uh, inspired by the uh, big challenges and big puzzles. And so uh, there is a uh, ambition I have to try to synthesize the great things that have been shared here. But to be quite honest, uh, it does feel as though there's quite a few uh, opportunities and uh, ways to approach this moonshot idea. I also, I, I think that there are perhaps even stages of moonshots that can be built in a stackable way, almost like software, to help us get to these goals. And as I, I'm, I don't want to repeat them, but all the ones that, are, uh, that I mentioned before, some of the, the privacy example and the consumption example that, that Kevin and Joy brought up, I think all of those are fantastic. I think that they also exist uh, in a uh, ecosystem that is evolving as the business uh, sector is. And so with that, I mean, I'll, I'll basically just uh, keep these questions open, uh, not to come to any clear and uh, digested resolution at this point, but it's probably a great way to prime the pump into the next portion of our agenda. Good news, we're gonna take a break. But after the break, uh, we're going to, uh, and I'll, I'll describe it now so it's easier for us to go back into those sessions when the time comes. So we're gonna have small breakouts. Uh, there'll be three moderators and there'll be three groups there are 18 members at the table, and so uh, we'll allow you to uh, please uh, separate yourselves how, how you so, so choose, but I'll define where these groups go. So three groups, user operability, data dissemination and use, and the return on investment for data. Someone, someone brought that up. Now these are broad categories, and if there's 10 people in one group, we're gonna kick out four of you and put you in another group anyway. So, uh, but I just wanna give you the opportunity at least to self-select a little bit. So I'll say user operability will be in this corner, I'll say the green corner to my left. The uh, data dissemination and use will be at the table, the white table where it currently says note taker. We're gonna have that be the second group. And I'll just say the ROI group, we're gonna have in the back corner um, by the blue light. Um, and for those of you that are members of the public that uh, want to 
continue to observe. Uh, we ask that you are uh, basically, we apologize, we have to move your chairs, uh, but you're welcome to observe. Uh, we ask that you allow the council members uh, to sit in a way that allows them to have substantial conversations. For those that are watching online, we will continue to have the uh, live stream open, but we will not, we don't have the facilities to have a small camera in each of the uh, breakout groups. Uh, so it may be uh, unfortunately a little hard for those that are remote to continue observing the conversations. We will have note takers at each of the small uh, groups for you to basically serve as facilitators and the moderator will uh, be there to basically uh, continue the discussion. But I'll, I'll, I'll pose this as the challenge. The questions that are brought up here and the moonshot opportunities that are brought up here. What we're hoping for in the next portion of the agenda is a little more uh, depth into how this can actually be achieved. I think to Mark's point, reiterating the challenge from the secretary, what are those top 10 things? And maybe one of them is just finalize the moonshot. Okay, well, it's good, it's a great idea. Uh, we, we probably should do that. Um, there, I've offered one of them. Um, but the, those specific takeaways are what we're hoping for from the small group breakouts. So that tomorrow, one of you from each of your small group breakouts will present to the larger council what you recommend those top 10 things should be. So again, we're gonna break into small groups, go a little deeper, take some good uh, actions, and one of you, I hope, will volunteer to present your group tomorrow. Uh, so any questions on the logistics before we break? And it maybe a sense for where you wanna go? Should, um, since we're trying to get to 10 total, should each group come up with three to five and not 10? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great suggestion. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, anything else, any other, any uh, final points before we take a, a short break? So uh, from an agenda perspective, what time is it now? So we, late, so let's, all right, so if, 3.35. Yeah, at uh, 3.35 is about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, if all of you can please uh, choose a group and we will start at 3.35 with a small group breakouts. Thank you very much.
could start in about two or three more minutes.
Excuse me. For those heading over to the Department of Commerce, make sure that you enter the 15th and Pennsylvania exit or entrance to the department. 15th and Pennsylvania. It's in your folders. Um, that's the only entrance we can go in to get to where we're going for the, uh, sec the meeting with the secretary, <laughs> the reception with the secretary. And again, that's in your folders.